Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen leaves a fake tip at a restaurant. Yesterday, my mom and I went out to a restaurant to get some dinner. We haven't been out to eat since before lockdown, so this was a treat for us. We got there before the dinner rush, so about 10 minutes after we were set and ordered, tons of people started turning up. One group was a family of seven. The parents, the girl, the boy, the two little kids, and a baby. They'd taken up two tables to the left of us and started up instantly with the noise. Our waitress was swamped. Her whole section got filled in the span of five minutes, so I didn't blame her for being stretched thin. But the dad next to us was audibly complaining about the crappy tier service. I heard him say, I know how to get her attention, before we saw him pull out what I thought was a $20 bill. But then I saw the other side of it, and it was white with some text. I instantly knew what it was and was appalled. I watched him fold the 20 in half and tuck it under the ketchup. The waitress saw it too and brightened and was extra nice to them. I was disgusted because I was a server for over 10 years, so I've had people pull that on me and it's devastating to be paid pennies and think, oh, I'm getting a good tip, only to have the rug yanked out from under you with one of those fake money Bible verse pamphlets. I told my mom I was going to tell the waitress, but she said for me to mind my own business. I told her what they were doing was crappy, and despite her hushing, I waved the waitress over when my drink got low and gestured for her to lean in a bit before whispering that the 20 the table had out was fake. It was just one of those pamphlets disguised as money. She looked stunned, but thanked me. Afterwards, it was pretty obvious that the table was getting the least amount of tension she could get away with giving them. She didn't ignore them, but they were definitely her absolute last priority. I guess they didn't like that and left ASAP, leaving the fake 20 there. And yeah, I saw her pick it up, check it, and then toss it. I felt really bad for her. She was clearly busting her butt. So I left her a really good tip, three times the usual amount I leave. On the ride home, my mom and I got into an argument. She was mad at me for being meddlesome in things that didn't concern me but I think I did the right thing. I'd have wanted someone to tell me if I'd been in her shoes. I got mad and snapped that she was just as bad as those jerks who thought leaving a Bible verse was adequate payment. She yelled for me to not raise my voice at her, but I said I wouldn't have if she had been a decent person. But then my brother agreed with her, so now I'm at a loss. Was I the jerk for snapping at my mom? Am I the jerk? Well, what would you have done in this situation? Would you have informed the waitress what they were doing or not? Please let us know. I would have walked over there and got everyone's attention in the restaurant, then picked up the little pamphlet and exposed what these people were doing. The looks on their faces would have been priceless. Don't turn in your paper. My kid needs to be noticed by the teacher. Backstory. It's June, and in Bulgaria, it's exam time. All of your final exams, essays, etc. are packed into a week or two. The story is about our philosophy teacher, and more precisely, her homework. She gave us the essay final. Basically, you write an essay as your final. It's cool because it's easy and not really read and remember. It's like, what would you do if something, and why would you do that? You get the idea. She gave us that two weeks before the turn-in deadline. That exact deadline was three days ago. On to the story now. So a week before the deadline, I was pretty much done so I decided to show it to my entitled friend. He thinks he owns the world. I made a mistake showing it to him. The only thing he said was, Nice, that looks great. Nothing less, nothing more. This happened in school. The essay was on my Google Drive. In the afternoon, I'm at home, and I get a call from an unknown number. My first guess is that my phone carrier is offering me a new tariff plan, since mine is close to expiration. Nope, I was wrong. It was my entitled friend's mom, entitled parent. I guess he gave my number to him. Karen. Hello, are you OP? Me, 
Indeed I am. How can I help you? Hey, this is Entitled Friend's mother. He told me that you wrote a great looking essay. Is that true? Me. I guess. I really like it. Well, can you not turn it in and give it to us? <laughs> Excuse me? Why would I do that? Because my son really needs to be noticed. He's a really bad student. First of all, her son really is a bad student. One of the main reasons for that is because his parents constantly took him for unexpected vacations without studying for a fraction of a second and going with the excuse, I wasn't in class. Second, our teachers are not goats and don't graze grass. She'll notice that her worst student is now writing a great essay. Me. Uh, I am going to turn in my essay, the one I wrote. You didn't write it. My son did. You stole it. Yeah, whatever you say. All right, we'll be expecting it by Friday. A day before the deadline. Me. Whatever. I hang up. Of course I didn't. So Friday passed. Saturday, Sunday. And here we go Monday, today, the 21st of June. I already turned it in. Our teacher enters the room, checks if everyone is in class, and starts discussing the essays. Entitled friend is in the beginning of the list of students, and she goes, Nice teacher. All right, entitled friend, it looks like you didn't turn in anything. Entitled friend. That's not true. I've written an amazing essay, but OP stole it. Me. What? Nice teacher. What are you talking about? Entitled friend. I showed OP my essay, and he stole it. It was on my Google Drive. Nice teacher. Can you show me? No, he stole it. Our teacher is pretty good with computers, to be honest. Nice teacher. Well, he can't delete it from your Google Drive, even if he stole it. It should be on your drive. Entitled friend goes silent, and the teacher continues. I'm a bit later in the list. She comes up to my name and goes, OP, that's a great essay. It's really good. I really liked reading it. She went to everyone from the class. That was the end? Nope. We finished school, and on the way to the bus, I was stopped by a lady. It was the Karen, of course. Where do you think you're going? Me. Home? Not until you return to my son his essay and tell your teacher you lied. Me. If I say that, that's gonna be a lie. Shut up. So, just go tell the teacher and everything will be fine for you. Me. Excuse me? Are you threatening me? Yeah, you stole my property. So what was the essay about then? Son? He can't remember. Face palm. Friend. Well, it was about a homeless man. Me. Uh, no. You changed it. You stole it and then you changed it. Me. First, don't yell at me. Second, even if I stole it and then changed it, that means it's no longer his. Of course it is. Whatever I say is his. My husband is a lawyer. He can take all your homework and give it to my son. Me, laughing. My nice teacher who noticed this. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to leave OP alone. He stole my son's essay. Nice teacher. He doesn't even remember what it's about. Also, I checked OP's document. It was edited one week before the deadline, and your son turned in a blank document. He stole it. This is your last warning to leave him alone, otherwise I will call the police. Fine. Ugh. At least give my son an A. He deserves it more. Nice teacher, visibly confused. Sorry, but your son is the worst in my class. That's not possible. Ugh. And she walks away. That's it. I can't believe that happened over a philosophy final when we have 12 other classes he can work on. But no, let's do this over a philosophy and not math, for example. Thanks for reading. My Karen half-sister demands I pay for her plastic surgery. I, 32 male, was born from my mother, Clara, 57, her cheating. She's married to Greg. I have four siblings who are all sisters. A, who's 36, B, who's 34, C, who's 26, and D, who's 24. My grandparents have raised me because Greg refused to raise another man's kid and there was no paternity test needed because I was mixed. I never even met my father and didn't know his name. My grandma was an American Italian housewife. She was clearly my caretaker and for me, my only mama. Grandpa was very strict, but an also caring man and is slash was always an idol to me. 
Both my grandparents were furious to my mother, not only because of her cheating, but because she abandoned me. This situation led to my grandparents' decision to make me the only one who inherits almost everything. My grandma passed at 64 from a heart attack and grandpa passed at 71 with lung cancer. Grandpa had a life insurance and I was the only beneficiary of almost $300,000. I got the house I was raised in marked value, $280,000, and last grandpa created a family fund with $400,000. I had to manage it. The rules for this fund are simple. I can only use it for emergencies, health, crisis like now, and only for me and my half-siblings. Clara and Greg are not included in this fund. Until now, I've paid for A's IVF for her fertility issues, nearly $40,000. Her health insurance hasn't covered it. And C's appendix removal, $15,000. Health insurance has covered a great part. So far, no problems. But D plans to have plastic surgeries, a whole package of it, all kinds of surgeries. It would erase nearly half of what is left in the fund. I refused because it's not an emergency. I would be okay with paying for plastic surgery if it was needed, example, if an accident had happened, but she just wants her makeover for her boyfriend. Of course, we had an argument which was not so pretty and they threatened to sue me. They had sued me before, but grandpa had made sure everything was totally fine. So, am I the jerk if I stand on my feet? Mini update. I had a talk with all of my sisters and it came out they had no clue about Dee's plans. My mother tried to enable Dee in her lifestyle, and now my other siblings are very upset. I have invited everyone to my house and made sure again that the fund is only for health issues. It turned into a screaming match between them. I just stood out of the conflict. So I haven't had any sleep yet, and I really have to go to bed. Many of you have asked why I paid for A's IVF, simply because it affected her mental health. Many of you asked if D has deformations. No, she's just an average looking person for her age, but she wanted to be special, her words. Again, thanks for all your responses and have a great day. What would you do in this situation? Would you pay for her plastic surgery or not? Please let us know. Of course not, but I would pay for some serious legal counsel on how to protect this money from those jerks. Nothing beats scummy landlords during lockdown. I hated my old apartment, needed to desperately get out, and right when I was looking for rentals last year, lockdown hit and everyone shut down. With less than a week on my lease, I had to jump at the first available home. Didn't even get to inspect it. I ended up with equally horrible property managers. I didn't have a key on day one, had to break in to move in. They didn't tell me about the German roach infestation. It's okay, I used to do pest control, so I managed, and so forth. Right when I lost power during Christmas, also okay, I live in the south, I don't get too cold. I tracked down the original property owner and asked her if I could get out of the contract and just pay her directly. We investigated many options and the best way to get out of the contract was to just pay for the last remaining months and write a 30 day notice. They call me and tell me that I have to write them a notice, signed and sent and received on the exact date 30 days from the lease's end to be accepted or I will lose my $1,000 security deposit. They really stressed it had to be mailed and definitely on time or they won't be able to accept it. Cue my pettiness. I wrote a template letter with a generic, this is a number of days till lease end, day notice. I'm writing to terminate my contract and to receive my security deposit as stated. I sent one out on my 103 day notice, then another one on my 89 day notice then another one on my 73 day notice and so forth. Basically, whenever I remembered about it, I would change the date around, print it, sign it, and then mail it. They call me saying this is very unnecessary and that they got my message loud and clear, but they sounded pretty rude about it, so I sent some more. I then received some passive aggressive emails that they will honor the contract and leave me the $1,000 deposit as I have sent them a 30 day notice, but they can be tricky and as I haven't technically sent them an exact 30 days notice, I have some more letters to send. Plus again, they sounded pretty rude over email. Cue the final 15 day countdown till my 30 day notice letter. I upped the ante. I now have one letter per day to send and I've changed the fonts on each letter ranging from Papyrus to Jokerman to Comic Sans. My favorite one is the one where it's all bright yellow and barely legible. It just hurts looking at it. Oh, and better yet, 
I got the last batch sent as certified mail, so I get an email that they received it and that they have to sign for it. On my 34th day notice letter, now probably the 20th letter I've mailed, I receive my cashier's check back. No message or anything. Fortunately, I have four more letters to send. The best $43 on stamps I've ever paid. How my dad got a supermarket shut down for a day. My dad owns a small vending machine company and for years one of his accounts was the local grocery store. He had a couple machines in the back in the employee areas that were there for years. It was a weird little break room. It was on the second floor up a narrow staircase in the stock room. To get the machines in originally, they had used the forklift and put them through a cargo door on the second floor. Years later, the store had been bought by a generic regional grocery chain and they decided to redo the whole back area. The new manager asked my dad to remove his machines as they were going to tear down the break room. We went down on the weekend to remove them and asked if they could lower them from the cargo door for us. The manager flipped out and flatly refused, telling us it wasn't her problem and to take them down the stairs. We measured everything and figured out that they were simply too wide to go down the narrow staircase and tried to explain the problem to the manager. Her reply was, Cut the darn things in half or I'll get a sawzilla and do it myself. This was her critical mistake. The machines were very old and destined for the junkyard anyway, and she had just graciously offered to cut the machines in half for us. We went upstairs and took the stock plus the valuable electronic parts from the machine and left the useless shells there for her to sawzall at her pleasure. At the time, I had a friend who worked at the store who I had explained the situation to. She told me that the manager was awful and roundly disliked and some not so nice names that they referred to her by. A few days later, she called me up laughing. Apparently, they had planned to do the demolition overnight and open in the morning, but on the night of the demolition, there had been a major problem. Two vending machines were still up in the break room and they had deemed it unsafe to destroy the structure with them up there. Also, they had removed the forklifts due to the construction, so there was no way to get them down. Eventually, they had to attempt to cut the machines in half, but they're pretty tough, so it took way longer than expected. The end result was they ran far over time and had to keep the store closed a day to finish the teardown. The manager was still in charge there for a couple of years and used to glare at me anytime I was in there shopping. Am I the jerk for telling my friend I don't want to be her bridesmaid anymore? My friend, Mary, and I have known each other since we were kids. We've grown apart over the past few years, but she still considers me important enough to make me a bridesmaid. Her wedding is set to be in three weeks. One reason why I sort of distanced myself from her was because of her treatment of my relationship. My boyfriend, Jack, and I have been together for three and a half years. He's a wonderful person and there is no doubt in my mind that this is the man I want to marry. But Mary is under the impression that Jack is too good for me. Jack comes from a very wealthy background. His parents are certainly very wealthy. He was practically guaranteed a lavish life from the moment that he left the womb. This is in stark contrast to my childhood. I grew up in a low-income neighborhood, often wondering where my next meal was or how I was going to help pay the bills at a young age, etc. I'm grateful and proud for where I am today. Jack is considered to be conventionally attractive, always looking like he should be on some magazine or billboard somewhere. Jack's good looks and background have led Mary to believe that Jack deserves better than me, as according to her, there's no way I could have pulled someone so attractive and rich. It's pretty disheartening to hear those things constantly and it does kind of take a toll on you and the friendship. Whenever Jack is around, she's quite polite and respectful never once making those comments. Eventually, the comments stopped. Mary invited me for lunch with her fiancé and his friend, Gary. From the moment I arrived, Mary and her fiancé were consumed in their own conversation, paying no attention to the both of us. It was fine, as Gary seemed to be a great lad with great chat. He asked me why I was single, and I told him that I was in a happy, committed relationship. He was very taken aback by my answer. He told me that Mary had set up a blind double date of sorts for the both of us. I was very confused and slightly angry. I didn't want to be confrontational at lunch, especially in public, so I just carried on with the lunch. Luckily, Gary wasn't upset and ended up making a few jokes about the whole ordeal. I called Mary later on in the day and asked her a ton of questions about why she thought it was okay to do that. At first, she tried to deny it, 
but then she tried to justify it by saying that Gary is a man who's more in your league. And since he was also a groomsman, we needed to get you to know each other better. I was shocked by her bluntness, so I just told her that I didn't want to be her bridesmaid anymore. Granted, it was a pretty impulsive decision, but I still stand by it. Mary didn't take it well, trying to apologize and saying that it was a mistake. It's been a few days and her fiancé has been texting me, asking me to stop it and just do it for the wedding. I feel petty and conflicted right now. Edit. Jack knows about the date. I wouldn't keep that from him. Well, what do you think? Should OP still be Mary's bridesmaid or not? Please let us know. No, Mary is toxic and you need to cut her out of your life. Am I the jerk for how I responded when my stepdad asked why I didn't bring him a Father's Day gift? Context. My mom remarried when my brother and I were kids. My brother never accepted my mom's marriage, neither had I, but my brother was honest and clear about how much he disliked my stepdad for treating us like second-class citizens, forcing us to stay home and not visit family on every holiday. We had no birthday parties and were forced to work as assistants in his auto shop. My brother was isolated because of his attitude towards our stepdad and was sent to live with my aunt eight hours away for two years. And I remember begging mom to take me to see him, but she said my stepdad is the one with a car and couldn't take me. I kept in contact with my brother after he was banned from the house. I was 14 at the time and couldn't travel to see him. He ended up passing a week before my 15th birthday. I was devastated I wasn't able to see, hug, or vent to him one last time. My mom got busy with my half-sister, but gradually I was forced to care for her because of my stepdad saying God sent her instead of my brother. I love my sister, but I was still broken because of what had happened with my brother and I wasn't ready for this. I moved out at 19. My mom helped with money and we maintained a relationship, but I never visit except my mom's family, my grandparents, my aunts and uncle and my half-sister. I see my stepdad there occasionally and I ignore him but act civil. We were gathered at my grandpa's house for Father's Day. I brought my grandpa and uncle gifts and they were happy to receive them. My stepdad spoke up and said I should have given him a gift as well since he is a father figure to me, then asked why I didn't. I laughed and told him not to worry, I'll get him a gift on Narcissus Day. Most of the family bursted into laughter. My stepdad's face turned red and he was about to blow up after hearing my response, then excused himself to the bathroom. Mom was very upset with me but waited until I was alone and she got mad at me for treating her husband like this and shames me for basically calling him a narcissist in front of her family. She said she won't let me leave until I've apologized profusely for not getting him a gift and then doubling down and being spiteful and humiliating him in front of everybody, but I refused to do it and told her off. My aunts were upset too and thought it was an inappropriate response for me and a ruined Father's Day for my stepdad who's done a lot for me. Was I the jerk for how I responded? I'm a 24 year old male by the way, sorry for the confusion. Leave immediately? Bad idea, but okay. It's been a while since I've had a tale for this sub. I'm the whole IT department in the city for the crunchy food company that makes and distributes fried potatoes in my country. We'll be calling them Mr. Tato. Now, as any other big company with distribution chains, Mr. Tato relies heavily on its communication infrastructure which makes maintenance both important and hard to schedule. This night in particular, me and my contractor buddies were scheduled to do maintenance to the electrical outlets that go to the site rack, which of course will cause internet downtime. We arrive on site, all is normal. Enter the site, I turn off all networking equipment, procure some fried goodies and settle down while my people start doing their work. Then trouble comes when I'm contacted by Mary, the boss guard lady. Now, Mary is super nice, I have a good relationship with the security guards on the sites I work with, in part because they are usually great to drink with, in part because it always pays to get along with security. Mary tells me she was not aware we were having a midnight rendezvous with the site, which is weird because this whole thing is set up weeks in advance. She tells us to carry on, but contacts her boss. I never met her boss, but as first impressions go, this was not going to be a good one. Boss was mad. He is irate that we are working in his precious building without his knowledge and appalled that we would just march in and do the work we were scheduled to do without giving him proper tribute. Apparently, he was never CCD on any of the multiple work emails needed to coordinate the whole thing during the previous weeks. 
He demands we stop what we are doing immediately and leave the premises. I try to explain myself, but he is fresh out of hoots to give. Hangs up on me. I talk to Mary and explain to her what her boss actually did. And then me and my buddies comply, giggling with anticipation. Leaving immediately means we leave the electrical work half done, the site with no power, whole building with no internet, and just go. I know how this is going to go. They know how this is going to go. The guards know how this is going to go. I just park outside, buy myself an energy drink, and call my supervisor first and the location manager second. Then I sit down with my buddies and the guards and enjoy the drama. See, with the site down, there's no internet, and sales cannot be made. Shipping cannot be sent. Cargo cannot be loaded. Orders cannot be put together. Every working hour without operation cost Mr. Tato himself a loss of tens of thousands of dollars. The site works 24-7 and labors were going to resume in about three hours. This is not obscure arcane knowledge, this is something every serious Mr. Tato employee knows. The guards are outsourced and still they know, but because I have explained it to them in detail over drinks and because occasionally I need to come running at 3 in the morning when something fails and stops operations. Management rained hard on security guy. For a full hour, I heard him call the guards, blaming them for not explaining the situation correctly, all the while maintaining we can't work the site. Finally, at 12.30, he folds. We go in. Half an hour later, we are out. Site is powered up, all services are working, and people can come into work ignorant to how close they came to doom. What will become of security guy, I wonder? Hopefully, he learns something. Am I the jerk for not going to family dinners because they fit the time with my sister's schedule and never mine? I, 20 female, work full time, 8 to 5 Monday through Friday. I'm currently working from home due to world events. I also live on my own. My sister, who's 18, goes to college classes in the evenings and works a couple of days a week. Ever since my sister has started her evening college classes a couple months now, every family event is centered around her schedule. Her college classes start at 5 in the evening, so our schedules overlap. Meaning, if we have dinner, they eat before I'm off work to coordinate with my sister. So when I get there around 5.15 to 5.30, I'm stuck eating alone while everyone else has already ate or sometime is already leaving. The issue in this matter is my grandma's birthday party. My mom put it together. Same sort of deal. My sister had class. I had to work until 5.00. I asked if instead of centering it around my sister's schedule, if she could be the one to eat early and we fit into my schedule this time. My mom said it made more sense to fit around my sister's schedule. When I asked why, because I literally couldn't think of a difference it would make, she said, it just does. I spoke with my grandmother and she said she would wait to eat with me, but everyone else wouldn't. She also could not understand the reasoning behind it. But she said since she was not the one cooking or planning, she didn't feel she had much control over it. I told my mom that unless we could start alternating, fitting with my sister's schedule one time, then mine the next, I would just start skipping out on family dinners and that it was not fun to always have to be the one eating alone. My mom told me I was being a jerk and immature about the whole thing. I just don't feel it's fair the way we're doing it right now. Mine and my sister's are the only schedules that need to be worked around. Am I the jerk here? Editing to clarify a couple of things. Weekend dinners are not usually an option as my grandmother still works, by choice, on the weekends. So weekday evenings are usually better as she's not working. These family dinners are not a nightly thing, more of a couple of times a month thing for things like birthdays, graduations, or sometimes just to eat, but it's not nightly, more like a couple times a month. My sister does not live at home either. She lives with her boyfriend, whole different train wreck. So she's driving to my mom's as well, only adding this to clarify that they definitely could alternate between us since she is having to come over as well. They just don't. My parents are divorced and this is my mother's side of the family, so my dad has no input here. I do provide some of the food for the dinners as well. Sometimes I will bring a dessert or something, but usually I will provide some of the food that will be cooked, like meat to be grilled as an example, since I can't bring a side dish because everyone has already eaten before I get there. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you stop going to the family dinners or not? Please let us know. I'd still go. Food is food, bruh. But that's just me. Two for one, idiot combo. I work at a brunch place in the USA and had these two interactions not even five minutes apart. Guest one orders the eggs benedict and after receiving their food flags me down. Excuse me, 
I ordered the Eggs Benedict, which was supposed to come with Canadian bacon. They gave me ham instead. I glance at the plate, which definitely has perfectly round and brown slices of Canadian bacon, and reply, yeah, that's actually our Canadian bacon. Looks correct. No, this looks like ham to me. It was then I realized someone needed an education on different cuts of pork. Our Canadian bacon is from a different cut of pork than regular bacon, so it looks similar to ham, but has a slightly sweeter taste. If you prefer, I can get your Benedict remade with bacon strips instead. Guest one grumbles and declines, their hunger forcing them to resign to the food already in front of them. Guest two orders the red velvet chicken and waffles, says they're lactose intolerant. I advise them they do contain buttermilk, so would not be lactose free. I automatically omit the cream cheese frosting, because cream cheese, lots of lactose. She throws in a side of eggs, and I ask how she wanted them cooked. How do they come? They ask as my mind races, thinking, have you never ordered eggs before in your life? Before rattling off, scrambled, over easy, etc. Guest blurts out, scrambled, to which I mention, absolutely, we can have that made with cracked eggs only, no milk. I should have known something was up when I received a confused glance, but she said nothing of it. Their order is brought out, and the guest asks for a side of whipped cream and says that we forgot the cream cheese frosting. I again warn them that these items definitely contain lactose. They respond, yeah, that's fine. Was this a made-up allergy, or does this person not know the types of food they can or can't eat? I guess we'll never know. My Karen ex takes me to court over the school lunches I pack. Contentious divorce with ex-wife. Got to experience a lot of the things that everyone experiences, but more so. One episode was when she hauled me into court, accusing me of not feeding them, packing them moldy sandwiches, lots of other things. She even claimed that the teachers were aware of this and that they had taken to providing my kids food since I'm so neglectful. None of it was true, and thankfully, I was able to successfully defend myself in court. But court is nerve-wracking. Apparently, I forgot to say explicitly what the judge needed to hear me say. No, I don't pack moldy sandwiches for the kids. So I get a court order decreeing that kids shall only be provided with fresh healthy food. No sanctions, no punishment. Just a pretty reasonable decree to be a good parent, which is what I strive to be anyway. But what Judge doesn't know, and I do, is the chocolate sandwiches. My kids have always been picky eaters. I was never happy about this, but with everything else that they've gone through with the divorce, this was way down on my list of things to deal with, which means that yes, when their mom packs them chocolate sandwiches for lunch, I would also pack them chocolate sandwiches. I'm not proud of it, but the kids don't need to see conflict between their parents. And believe me, there have been other, bigger parenting issues to deal with that I won't get into here. But now I have a court order to provide healthy food. I'm sure as heck not going to be back in front of that judge and try to argue that chocolate sandwiches count as fresh healthy food. So I send an email to X explaining that the kids will be eating the free school lunches from now on. Note, free school lunches, which means they were never in any danger even if her claims had been true. But when I tell her the kids will be eating school lunches from now on, she is very upset. Oh, but they are sensitive. There aren't options that they will eat. How can you be so cruel? Can't you at least provide them with chocolate protein bars? You see, she knows what I've been packing them because it's exactly the same thing she packs them. She didn't want me to change it, she just wanted to get me in trouble. Also, it is impossible to understate how important control is to her. Denying these kids their special chocolate sandwiches is in line with denying them fresh water. Like, it is incredibly important to this woman that every little wish and desire of her kids be granted, and to not humor them is, in her eyes, quite unacceptable. Also, denying her control over what goes on in my house is very upsetting. But nope, nope, and nope. Take me to court over the food I pack? I'm not packing food anymore. Duh. So I email with the court, not the judge, to make sure I have support for this school lunch plan. Yes, yes I do. So the next time I get the kids, I explain to them the new plan. They parrot back their mom's talking points. But can't we make the chocolate sandwiches? We are so sensitive. There aren't other options we can eat. Can't you at least give us chocolate protein bars? Nope, nope, and nope. Each week I get to ask them, how was the school lunch? And it's a win-win for me. 
If they answer, not good, I can trot out the old, it's good for you to try different things, and I can enjoy knowing I'm teaching them life skills. And if they say it was good, I can genuinely be happy for them. And to be honest, I'm looking forward to going back to court and explaining to the judge that X is still packing chocolate sandwiches. Edit. Chocolate sandwiches is two slices of bread with chocolate hazelnut butter spread between them. But calling them Nutella sandwiches gives them a dignity I feel they do not deserve. Speaking of lunches, what do you usually eat for lunch? Please let us know. I'm in the mood for a chocolate sandwich myself. Carrying a large stack of clothes, but I don't work here. Back in the before times, before lockdown, I went to a department store to pick up some outfits for a friend's wedding. I say outfits, plural, because in my friend's culture, weddings take place over several days with many different events. I was picking out at least three dresses with matching jackets and shawl options as I wasn't sure what would look good whilst being considered appropriate and modest. I was too nervous to wear a sari. I've never worn one before and even though they are beautiful, I'd have no idea how to put it on or take it off. It's not something I would have wanted to bother the bride or her family with during her wedding. I must have been carrying 9 or 10 items around the store with pretty much my entire body blocked by the huge piles of clothes I was going to try on. I'd come straight from work, so I was wearing a white button-down shirt and plain black trousers and with a giant pile of clothes, it wouldn't be immediately apparent that I wasn't wearing a lanyard and obviously didn't work there. I was just buying a lot of items. As I was heading towards the fitting rooms, an older lady, maybe in her 70s or 80s, walked up and asked where she could find one of the jackets I was carrying. At this point, I had wandered through so many departments of the store, I couldn't remember what area I had picked it up from. I politely explained that I didn't actually work in the store and was choosing items for a friend's wedding. The lady was so sweet when she realized I didn't work there. She profusely apologized for bothering me. She hadn't bothered me at all. And she got a bit teary and said how much she loved weddings. She offered to say a prayer for my friend and her future husband and to wish them a long and happy life together. She even told me which of the dresses I'd picked up she thought would look best on me. A dress in a jewel tone that was a bit brighter than what I would usually wear, but when I did try it on, she was totally right. It looked lovely. Sometimes, I think about that sweet lady and hope that she gets to attend many more weddings and joyous events in her future. So no shouting, no Karens, no drama. Just a lovely older lady in me carrying a comically large pile of clothes. Karen wants to use a coupon her way despite the rules. Many moons ago, I worked for a restaurant that had coupons. They were hugely popular with customers, but the servers hated them because coupons brought in the cheapskates. One promotion was a buy one, get one free dinner, a rack of ribs. The kicker was you had to buy an appetizer and dessert to get the freebie. People never read the small print, so I would tell my customers when they used the coupon that was required. This one table, I'll call them Karen and Ken, didn't listen to a word I said. They ignored and interrupted me. They ordered two rib plates, a kid's cheeseburger, and chicken fingers for the little one. Karen made sure I understood she wanted the appetizer plate, not the kid's one. I knew what she was doing. She wanted his meal to count as the appetizer so they could use the coupon. The thing was, the coupon specifically stated the appetizer could not be used as a meal. When I tried to explain they needed another appetizer to qualify for the coupon, Karen became frustrated. She bragged that she was some uppity jerk at some big company and that made her special. Plus, she's a customer. She said she could do what she wanted and dismissed me with a literal wave of her hand. Fine, I put the order in and they got their food. When done, they ordered pie and I dropped the check. The coupon was not on their bill as they hadn't qualified for it. Karen called me over. Karen, you forgot to take one of the rib plates off. It's not that hard. Are you new here? Me, as I told you before, your son's dinner does not count as an appetizer. Karen goes off and the manager happens by. He asks what's going on and Karen rants about how I'm trying to double bill them. He hears them out and then looks over the bill. Manager, it seems your order did not qualify for the coupon. What? It said appetizer and we bought one. Yes, and it was your son's meal, not an appetizer. It even came out with the rest of your food. Karen. So? Do you know who I am? I'm the customer. You do what I want. 
period. Manager, I'm afraid I can't do that. We have to follow the rules. Karen gets up and starts picking stuff up off the table. She tells her husband and kids to get up and it's time to go. The manager asks how she wants to pay. She says she won't be paying. They argue, while the husband and kids sneak outside. When Karen tried to slip past the door, several hostesses blocked her way. The manager followed her, holding their bill. She eventually made her way outside, where I could hear her screaming at everyone. In the end, the manager called the police. He stood behind their SUV and refused to move, even when she turned on the engine and revved it. When the police arrived, the woman became even more angry, screaming that we were harassing her family. Once it became clear the cop was on our side, the husband sheepishly opened his wallet and took out a wad of money. Karen saw this and began to scream at him, but he ignored her. As soon as the manager had the cash, no tip, he thanked them for coming by and went back inside. We heard Karen berating him in the parking lot for another 20 minutes before they finally drove away. I'm not sure I like that coupon to be honest. Am I the jerk for refusing to apologize for throwing away my dinner instead of letting my fiancé have it? I, female 22, had been with my fiancé, male 20, for two years and recently got engaged. I handle cooking while he takes care of other stuff, including rent and utility. He's been eating a lot lately. I started cooking in large pots and buying extra ingredients. He usually tells me what he'd like to eat for dinner. Note, I only cook dinner three times a week. Other than that, we have plenty of leftovers. So on to the situation. Last night, I cooked dinner early because he wanted to eat early. I prepared his plate and put my plate in the fridge ready to reheat for later. I was finished with studying and took a shower, then went into the kitchen to reheat my dinner and sat at the table by myself and began eating. My fiancé came out of the bedroom saying he smelled the food while he was inside playing video games and thought of joining me because he was hungry. Without even asking, he put his hand on my plate wanting to eat from it. I stopped him and told him he was being selfish as he already had his, a larger portion of what I cooked, and the food on my plate was barely enough for me. He complained about being hungry from playing video games. I told him I was hungry because of studying. He made a face and went to grab a spoon so we could eat together. I pulled my plate away and pointed at the fridge, telling him there were some leftovers in the fridge and he could go ahead and reheat some if he was still hungry. He refused and insisted to share my dinner. I stood my ground and didn't let him. He got really upset, threw his spoon in the sink and even spit at my plate. I was 100% taken by surprise and was so livid and disgusted. I shouted, what the heck did you just do? He just smirked at me, telling me to enjoy as he walked out. I called him childish and he turned around and walked back in, saying I was the one acting like a high school bully for refusing to let him share my dinner and telling him to just have leftovers. I said he was being selfish and petty to spit in my plate to stop me from eating and he managed to do it. I was so upset and I couldn't eat what was on my plate. It was gross and disgusting. I threw it in the garbage can and he threw another fit asking why I threw away perfect food and he was counting on me giving it to him after he spat on it. We had a major fight, probably the biggest fight we've ever had thus far. He says I was wrong. I escalated and he wants me to apologize first so we can put this past us but I said no way I'd apologize after he ruined my dinner and disregarded the time and effort I made to prepare dinner. Well, who do you think is in the wrong? OP or her fiance? Please let us know. I'm sorry, but why on earth are you still with this bozo? He needs to be out of your life, like five minutes ago. If you feel sick, go see a doctor. Okay, boss. ka -ching. About 10 months ago, I was going through a very hard time in my life. My job, my marriage, my family, everything was failing including me who had relapsed. Then the lockdown came on top. I desperately needed a break, or at least some slack. Since I was regarded as an essential employee, IT help desk admin grunt, my employer blocked all of my inquiries for some home office to catch a breath, get some distance between me and a certain micromanaging, inofficial team lead, and maybe even find enough time and power to tackle some of my personal problems. Home office would have meant saving three hours drive daily. Little background information. This was during a time where laws and policies changed almost weekly. Can't say if at that moment home office was even mandatory, if possible. But at least the whole world already slash still agreed everyone should stay home if possible. 
except my employer, who told me there's no home office. No, not even some hours after lunch break, and to go see a doctor if I didn't feel well enough to work. So I did, and the doc shook his head about my employer and gave me a sick note, and another one, and another one, until today. And I made good use of this time. As of today, I'm 241 days sober. My divorce is lined up, and my ex has recently finally moved out. Never in this time did my employer reach out to me, not even once. Well, someone from work I didn't really have anything to do with contacted me on a private channel, so I guess that was them eavesdropping. Until some weeks ago, when they sent me a dismissal. This I had been waiting for, since they are legally not allowed to do that, in my case at least. Thankfully, I have always been a fan of unions. Not a fanboy, but they do have their advantages one shouldn't miss out on, like free legal counsel. Now, after some dormammu, I've come to bargain, I have agreed to leave this toxic workplace in exchange for coin. These coins will help me replace the stuff my ex-wife took with her. I ain't even mad. Would I be the jerk if I built a privacy fence, even though it would ruin the neighbor's view? Last year, we, family and I, bought a beautiful 1.5 acre property. We have a pond and old growth trees, fruit trees, a creek, and lots of birds. It really is a dream place. Here's the problem. One, we are separated only slightly from a busy road. Two, we had privacy on one side with about 15 feet of brush. However, we recently woke up to chainsaws and were told that the man who owns the lot next door was clearing it for development, removing all semblance of privacy. Three, we have nosy neighbors on the other side who have been very particular about the property line and us not affecting their property. There have been several small, petty incidents in the short time that we've been here. They have a cute fence along the back side of the property, which while aesthetically pleasing, provides no privacy or security. They are an older couple who manicure their lawn to perfection, whereas we prefer the look and feeling of wildflowers, gardens, and natural spaces, nothing out of control or ugly. 4. I've been building a large vegetable garden. However, several times the neighbors have simply stood in their yard and watched. The man is often shirtless doing so, and I'm becoming increasingly uncomfortable being in the backyard without looking like I'm completing tasks and well-dressed. No going in the yard in my PJs for me. 5. We have a young golden retriever who, so far, has been restricted to a small dog run in the front yard. He gets very agitated when he can see us in the backyard while he's stuck inside, and I've tried a tie-out for him to join me in the garden, but he gets wrapped around trees so often that it's equally frustrating as him whining inside. The anxiety of having to keep up appearance in my own yard is becoming a lot, and I'm constantly worried that my dog will end up on the road or that he and I will never be able to enjoy the beautiful yard together. So, this recently sparked a conversation about spending the money necessary to build a fully secure privacy fence around the property. We are limited to six feet in our country, which is enough for us. However, I'm concerned about how the act will come across to the neighbors. Our backyard is lovely, and it actually goes around the back of the neighbor's yard. They get a full surrounding view of our trees, pond, and subsequent pleasantness. If we build our privacy fence, it would render their aesthetic fence useless and odd-looking against another, taller fence. We would almost certainly be reducing the value of their home by removing the feeling of openness and views in their backyard. However, my dog would be free to enjoy the whole property, and our yard would feel private and secure. I don't want a forever soured relationship with them, but I'm also at a loss for figuring out another solution to the problems listed above. So Reddit, but would I be the jerk for building this fence? Well, what do you think? Would OP be the jerk for building the fence or not? Please let us know. Of course not. It's your property. I would tell them about it first just to give them a heads up. But Doggy needs his play area. Am I the jerk for refusing to buy house supplies because my roommate won't pitch in? A family friend, 19 female, is renting a room from me, 26 female, until she finds her own place. She feels she shouldn't have to pitch in more than a few hundred dollars because she's only renting a room. But I don't think that's realistic because she uses my house supplies and eats my food. Extra info. When she first moved in, she didn't have a job or know what she wanted to do. So I told her not to worry about chipping in until she found a job and gave her free range of the house supplies and food. Now she has a job. I sat her down and told her she needed to buy her own food and house supplies, laundry soap, toilet paper, toothpaste, and be more respectful of my space. 
She agreed, but has been using my food anyway and being inconsiderate. When I confronted her, she pushed back and told me she felt like it was fair because she doesn't use a lot, but she does. At this point, I can't tell if she's trying to take advantage of my kindness or if she's just too young to understand. So I decided to stop stocking the house with groceries and supplies, only buying exactly what I need when I need it. I'm hoping that this will teach her a lesson about the value and impermanence of house supplies and food. Is that petty or tough love? Update. I got her to go grocery shopping and showed her my expenses. She still doesn't quite understand, it seems though. This morning she asked if we were out of butter. I was planning to move when my lease ends in September anyway, so I'll just tough it out until I move if I have to. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her roommate? Please let us know. If there's one thing I've learned from these stories, it's to never let anyone stay with you at your home. It won't be worth the headache. Entitled Dad trashes my basement and it's my fault. Backstory. My parents got a divorce when I was three. Since then, my father, who we will call Entitled Dad, has not really been in the picture. Imagine any stereotypical movie of a kid sitting on the front steps, bags packed and ready to go, just to find out that something came up and the weekend trip has been cancelled. The rare times that Entitled Dad did pick me up, I was dumped off with my grandparents and he would suddenly become sick. This continued until I was 19 and moved out of my mom's house. This is when he finally decided to re-establish contact with me. Not because I'm his son, but because now he can try to use me to meet girls around my age. This is how things have remained to this day 10 years later. Him showing up and begging to either pick up women or go to clubs. Many times in front of my current girlfriend. Honestly, I could tell stories about him for days. An important note about my father. He is a truck driver, overweight, smells terrible, and horribly addicted to tobacco. All forms. This plays a big part in this story. That brings me to the start of this year. Out of the blue, Entitled Dad calls me and says that he wants to watch the Super Bowl with me at my house. After talking it over and thinking that I have not seen him in over a year, I foolishly agree to have him over. February rolls around and I get a call from him again. Here, he insisted that he stays with me for the entire weekend, maybe more. After him pushing very strongly, I reluctantly agree. Again, thinking that it has been so long and things will be fine. Super Bowl weekend arrives and that Friday, Entitled Dad came rolling into town. Within minutes, he's complaining about anything and everything, asking where the best place to meet women at is. At this point, I'm already regretting my choice to let him stay, but I am too far into it at this point. I get him settled into the small bedroom in the basement. Then we go about meeting up with my brothers and his grandkids, which is a story for another time and another crap show. However, while meeting up with my brother, he decided that he wanted to watch the Super Bowl game with everyone. We decided to do it at my brother's house because there was more room. Finally, we are at the Super Bowl Sunday, and about noon, I go downstairs to wake up Entitled Dad. To this point, I had avoided going downstairs and just waited upstairs for him. I knock on the door, and he tells me to come in. I don't make it far though, because as soon as I open the door, I'm assaulted by the overpowering smell of B.O., which is made a million times worse because of the space heater that he turned on himself, being set on high and the small room being over 90 degrees. Through watering eyes and softly gagging, I tell Entitled Dad that we need to leave soon. This is when he starts telling me he wants to sleep a little longer and to go on ahead without him and start cooking slash setup. At this point, I just agree to it because I could not focus with the smell. Also, no, he did not notice that I was struggling because he just woke up and did not have his glasses on. At this point, I did not notice the state of the room because of my eyes watering and I couldn't focus. I head to my brother's house and I had just barely walked in that door as my brother is hanging up the phone from talking to Entitled Dad. He has decided to not watch the game with us. He has changed his mind and is going to drive to Las Vegas to have fun there. Needless to say, I was upset. This entire weekend was set up to watch the game and he ditches last minute to go to clubs. After I calmed down a bit, I had a good time with my brother and his family watching the game and eating some food. Later that night, I get home and go downstairs to make sure the space heater was off. This is where I find it. The entire time that he's been down there, he's been spitting his chewing tobacco on the floor, window seal, and bed. Plus, the bed had some dirt stains and sweat stains from him sleeping on it and the overpowering smell of B.O. I am extremely upset and I refuse to talk to him or call him. 
I figured I would not have to deal with him again for a long time and it will not be worth it. Oh, how I was wrong. After his Las Vegas trip, he keeps blowing up my phone, but I still don't answer. Several weeks this continues and I finally give in and pick up. Entitled Dad Wow, you finally picked up. Me Yeah, sorry about that. I was starting to think that you were not going to talk to me because I trashed your basement. Me Well, Entitled Dad, you are right. I did not like that and I did not appreciate you treating my house and property like that. Well, that's not my fault. You didn't accommodate me. The space heater was too hot. Me I'm sorry the space heater got too hot, but that does not... He cuts me off. Hey, I gotta go. He hangs up on me. Later on, I found out that he called two of my brothers. I have three older brothers. He told them I was horrible to him, that I was screaming and yelling. He told one brother that it was my fault because I did not provide him a trash can, even though Entitled Dad did not ask for one. The other brother he told that I did not accommodate him right, but did not go into details other than I yelled at him. The conclusion is nothing exciting. We're not talking and he is avoiding me. But to be honest, I would rather have it this way. Since I turned 19, he has never seen or treated me as a son, but as a buddy. Also something I should clarify as well. The reason I did not call or yell at him is because it's not worth it. He is a 62-year-old man-child that still technically lives with his elderly parents and makes them take care of him when he is not on the road in his truck. If we confront him, then he just makes life hard for them and whines and complains to them. So over the years, we have learned to deal with it, the rare occasions we see him, and then send him on his merry way. Well, you made it. If you read this far, thanks for reading and I appreciate it. Hopefully this will lead to more posts in the future. I was used for four years by a horse stable family who got mad at me when I quit and gave me pneumonia. Sorry for the rant, but this story still makes me sad 10 years later and has messed me up. I was like a lot of girls. I loved horses. That crazy horse girl was me and I was her. My parents weren't rich, so when I got 10 lessons at our local stables for my 9th birthday, I was ecstatic and I literally fell in love. I'd save up to ride and always dreamed about becoming a professional horseback rider. But there was one catch. The owners. They quickly saw my enthusiasm and being a new yard knee deep in work made an offer that I literally cried over with sheer joy. When I was 10, they said I could work there. So I started working every Saturday and Sunday, 7.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. and some days after school. But I wasn't getting paid and I actually had to pay them still for my half hour group riding lesson I would have on Saturday. Well, my parents weren't thrilled. Not only was I working like a dog there, they didn't have any shelter for me and wouldn't let me in their house. I remember one winter was so bad, I sat in a stable and cried, trying to heat my hands up against a horse. An 11-year-old, freezing, and they wouldn't let me in their mansion because I had work to do. I got pneumonia. I don't remember a lot from that period of time, but I do remember going back to horse riding after recovering and getting yelled at for being away too long. I was ignored, yelled at, and overall treated like crap. So my parents decided that at the very least, I shouldn't have to pay for lessons. Well, when I told the owners, they laughed at this and basically told me to buzz off. And I knew if I told my parents, then I wouldn't be allowed to go back. So my parents stopped paying for lessons under the assumption I was getting them for free due to all my work. And I just pretended I was getting them when in reality I wasn't. I started dreading going, but I loved the horses and couldn't imagine not seeing them every weekend. So I put up with the freezing weather and the exhaustion until I was 14. Something snapped and I had a mental breakdown and called my mom to pick me up. The owners were furious because I was supposed to be leading a few lessons that day. Another great perk of the job was walking around an arena for three hours nonstop leading the new riders. I hadn't finished cleaning all the horse stables. I couldn't do it anymore and I went home. For the first time in forever, I slept in and went out with friends. A few months later, I started missing the horses badly and booked a lesson so I could see them. I know, but I was desperate. But when I got there, my favorite horse had died. No one had told me. I was getting weekly texts from the owners demanding I go in, but no one had even thought to tell me that the horse I had grown attached to over four years had died. I left right then and there in tears. They still made me pay for the lesson I never even went to, even though it was a group lesson and this happened a few hours before it and sent messages to me until I blocked them. They sold their school horses shortly after and became a livery yard. 
I walked away from horse riding after losing all faith in the sport. I do still miss the horses I looked after and hope they're in the best homes possible. I gave this family my weekends, my time, and my childhood, and they didn't give me anything in return. Sometimes they would even pretend I hadn't paid for a lesson knowing I was too anxious to protest and I would cry when counting the money at the end of the day, counting that $30 I had given them for nothing. Sorry for the rant and typos, this has actually helped me relieve a lot of built up emotion and trauma I've had from that time. I have so many more stories of the entitlement of this family if anyone is interested. Thank you if you got this far. Edit. I am disgusted at the amount of people who have had the exact same experiences as me and touched at the overwhelming messages of support and encouragement. A lot of people have pointed out this is way more serious than I gave it credit for and I've decided after reading all of the comments I will try and take legal action or at the very least get the message out about how bad they treated the help. I'm not sure how it'll go but I realized if they did it to me they'll do it to others and I will try to shine a light on the truth of this company. I want to clarify about my parents. Unfortunately they were aware it was a bad situation. They had no idea I didn't have shelter or sanitary setups but they knew the owners treated me like crap. I would lie and tell them plots of horse cartoon, pretending I'd done it with my imaginary yard friends, sad I know, and that I was always given hot chocolate. And they did try to stop me from going a few times, but I would cry for days and beg them to let me go back because I loved the horses so much. They are racked with guilt to this day and apologized a lot. I didn't realize at that age what was going on, even though most of the time they would talk down to me and shout at me. They would occasionally compliment me and I would feel so appreciated and happy. Another point was the pneumonia thing. Just to clarify, I developed hypothermia and I already had childhood asthma. The only toilet at the stables that I was allowed to use was in a rundown shed that had never been cleaned in the years I was there, which probably didn't help at all. I don't really remember that part of the experience well, just being in the hospital for a bit and being off school for ages. Speaking of horses, have you ever ridden a horse? And if not, would you like to? Please let us know. I kicked out my Karen mom after she kicked out my boyfriend. I'm female, 26, and my mom and stepdad got divorced six months ago. She doesn't work and couldn't afford rent, so we, the family, agreed to take turns in letting her stay with us. I own an apartment and live alone and have plans to move my boyfriend of six months later. Mom moved in with me a month ago. She can be very conservative. She started acting bossy and had an attitude, especially towards my boyfriend. Examples. She took the copy of the key to the apartment that I gave to my boyfriend, saying we haven't been together long enough to trust him with my key, and gave scenarios of him coming in to steal when we're out. She left him waiting outside several times for showing up late, which was as late as 7 p.m. She never agrees to let him stay the night, and throws tantrums and gets too paranoid when that happens, then complains she couldn't sleep all night knowing that there was a stranger in the apartment. She did other things and set ridiculous rules for my friends, but that's another story. So I was getting fed up after talking to her, telling her I'm not a little girl and that she has to respect that it's my place. Yesterday I wasn't feeling well and was in bed all day. Mom was out all day. She came home and I asked if she was going to cook dinner. I was hungry and had no energy to stand. She said she had already eaten and that I should keep my stomach empty when I'm in pain. I ignored her and texted my boyfriend. He said he was on his way and brought food and pain medication. This was at 6 by the way. He said he needed an hour so I decided to rest before he arrived. But he arrived early and I was still in bed at the time when mom opened the door. I woke up to her screaming. I walked out and found her arguing with him at the door refusing to let him in. She was saying that it was late and that he should leave. I told her to step aside and let him come in, but she pitched a fit, saying there was no way in heck she was going to stay up till the morning because there's a stranger in the apartment. I said, he's not a stranger, he's my boyfriend. She said in her eyes, he's a stranger till he does the logical thing and puts a ring on it. I got mad and said she was acting like a crazy old woman right now. She reminded me she's my mother, but I reminded her it's my place. She turned and said to him, you can leave the food here and go home. It's getting late. Besides, she's not feeling well, so she's useless to you tonight. My boyfriend walked away, leaving the food and medication. I went off on her and yelled that she was out of line and she needed to pack her things and leave because I don't want her in my place after this stunt. She didn't think I was serious, 
till I pulled her bags and called an Uber. She then started crying and guilting me, then left to go to my brother's place. My brother was fuming, saying I was supposed to host her till the end of August and said mom didn't do anything and it was disgraceful that I'd do this to her over some guy. He's been mad along with the others at my behavior and told me to check myself, apologize and offer to take her in. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you let your mom live with you if she was acting like this or not? Please let us know. I'd let her stay in the backyard, put up a little tent or something. Employees' lunches are personal property, and the company is not responsible for lost or stolen personal items. Nobody likes a lunch thief, and I had one of the most aggressive at my office. There were rumors for a few months leading up to the inciting incident of someone going around and taking people's lunches. Just about every day, someone different would complain that their lunch was missing. It had even happened to me once or twice, but I figured, hey, it's a big office. A few people are probably just careless and grab the wrong lunch and are too embarrassed to bring it back or someone else packs their lunch and they don't know what's in there, so it's not obvious they have the wrong one or whatever. Most people just brought brown bags with their names on it anyways, or identical Rubbermaid Tupperware with a little piece of labeled tape on the side. It was easy enough to mix it up. I had accidentally grabbed a wrong lunch once or twice, but I had noticed before I got it open. I thought I was just more careful, or even just not as busy as some other people in the building. However, other people weren't as forgiving, and a quorum made complaints to HR. They were blown off. Personally, at the time, I thought it was all much ado about nothing. But then it began. My wife enrolled in a French cooking class online, and just about every day I was bringing fancy gourmet leftovers for lunch. You'd think I was picking up a to-go bag from a Michelin-starred bistro on the way to work each morning. She really threw herself into the coursework. There were no problems for about two weeks, maybe three, until one day my lunch went missing. Considering what delicacies I had to look forward to, I was pretty upset, but I did a once-over around the break room and didn't see anyone eating my lunch, so figured someone grabbed my bag by accident earlier, saw how good things looked, and, realizing it was their lucky day, didn't bring it back to the fridge. I wrote the mysterious stranger off as a jerk, but accepted the loss and looked forward to dinner that night instead. Next day, I write my name on my lunch in extra bold lettering, jam the bag into the back of the fridge, and feel peace of mind. I get there come break time. Nope, it's gone. I was pretty upset, but I figured it was a stroke of bad luck and left it at that. What else could I do? However, third day, out of an abundance of caution, I kept my lunch at my desk. A pain because I had to eat it fairly early in the day to avoid spoilage, but at least I'd know where it was. I got up to take care of some business down the hall, and when I came back, yep, my lunch was gone. Unfortunately, that didn't help me narrow it down much at all because my desk is centrally located, so everyone's constantly passing by. At that point, there was no possibility of the theft being arbitrary, so I approached HR and filed a complaint. Their response, practically verbatim, was, Employees' lunches are their personal property, and the company is not responsible for lost or stolen personal items. The following day, my wife packed a cream-based soup that really had to be refrigerated. I was passing by the break room to check on my lunch practically every five minutes. Somehow, it still managed to disappear. I was irate at this point and returned to HR and really blew my top. The best they could do was send a memo around about remembering to check the name on your lunch when you remove it from the fridge, but they made it very clear that it was a routine memo and in no way related to my complaints, which were not their jurisdiction so not an admission of responsibility because my lunch was my own personal problem. The only suitable alternative to packing a lunch available in the building are these wretched shrink-wrapped ham and cheese sandwiches from a vending machine. They've been marinating in the heat for God knows how long, and the bread is as stale as corkboard, and the meat is rancid, and there's gluey mayo smushed into the corner. It's a relic of the old office tenants, I'm pretty sure. I vented daily to my wife, but her only idea was to start bringing a regular sandwich and apple again to dissuade the thief and get him to move on to other lunches. So, determined to prevent this low-life jerk from downgrading the quality of my lunch, I hatched an elaborate plan. Then lockdown hit and I forgot all about this whole saga. I worked remotely for months and months. Then we returned, and after all that happened globally, 
this was the last thing on my mind. But I got to the break room the first day back, frustrated from having to wear a button-up and tie after months of working in pajamas, sore from my desk chair, and exhausted from small talk, only to find my lunch was gone. This was a particularly sore point, because my wife and I divorced between my last lunch work and the present one, so I did not appreciate being reminded of any past threads involving her. I pretty much flew into a blind rage at that point, especially seeing that stupid worthless memo about checking the lunch bag names posted in the break room, feeling so helpless and so hungry and so alone as it was me and my lunch against the world. I stormed out and was determined to return the next day with a plan. So I came in the following day with an empty lunch bag, and I checked closely to be sure no one was watching, and I switched the contents of the HR person's lunch bag into my bag. So now their lunch appeared to be my lunch. They had packed a regular brown bag, so I just discarded that and I left. And I waited. I knew this was a pretty big gamble because it was contingent on the theory that the thief was avoiding me while having lunch, but not wary of anyone else. So, would they eat out in the open if there were no risk of bumping into me? So I made a big show of going around the office, announcing that I was headed out for a meeting and I wouldn't be back until at least 3 p.m. I even went through the trouble of moving my car out of the lot to a space two streets over, where I then sat in my car and worked remotely for several hours before sneaking into the building up the back stairway. I then sat in the stairwell just outside the break room where you can hear chatter and can't be seen, and after about 20 to 30 minutes of waiting, I heard it. The sweetest sound I'll ever hear in the office. HR. What the heck, Kyle? That's my lunch. Lunch thief. No. Nah. It's not your name on the bag. HR. Give me that. I'm assuming grabs the bag and sees my name. HR. Yeah, let's head to my office for a chat. The HR rep later called me in as well and said they were aware of my break room hijinks, but it was obvious that the point still came across loud and clear. They warned me that it was a violation of policy to move another employee's lunch. It took every ounce of self-control for me to keep from retorting, I thought our lunches were our personal property, and the company was not responsible for them being lost or stolen. They informed me that they had located the thief and things would be handled accordingly. But better than whatever write-up they might be able to issue Kyle, his reveal as the lunch thief occurred in front of the whole break room. So word quickly spread as to who had been stealing everyone's lunches earlier last year, and he is now the office pariah. He was in line for a promotion. The promotion is indefinitely off the table. And I also earned brownie points for exposing him, though more than I'm satisfied with are being attributed to HR. At the end of the day though, I didn't do this for the credit, or even the sweet, sweet revenge. I did it to get my lunches back. Have you ever had someone take your lunch? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I would have put something special in that lunch. Teach that thief a lesson he won't forget. Am I the jerk for refusing to take my husband's last name? Me, female 26, and my fiancé, Jake, male 27, have been together for five years. We met in college while he was doing an exchange in my country, Belgium. He's from the US. He loved it here, so he decided to stay, and we are really happy here. I've met his family a few times when we went there to visit them. They've never been to Belgium, important for later. Now here, women don't take their husband's last name. It is the law. All documents will still be in my maiden name after our wedding. I think it is possible to do all kinds of administrative stuff to change my name, but I don't want to. All the women around me have their maiden name, and my fiancé agrees that I should keep my name. On to the main issue. Three days ago, we were doing a Zoom call with his family, and the topic of the name came up, and they were very surprised to hear that I was not taking his name. I explained very calmly that it is the law here, and that I had the perfect example of my mom who had a business in her maiden name and only used my father's name when dealing with our school or things like that and that I wanted to take the same approach as her. Well, all heck broke loose. His mom started screaming at me, saying that it's not because I came from a country of peasants that I should punish my fiancé, that he was so far away from them because of me and so on. Jake defended me and I tried to calm her down but she turned to her husband while crying that they never came to my country because they know it's not nearly as good as the US and that I just proved it and father-in-law said that I was being petty and that he didn't want to listen to such nonsense. 
They left the call, and my fiancé comforted me because I was honestly very shocked by their reaction and their insults. I thought it was over, but they've been sending messages over the past few days. They even got the rest of the family to do it as well, and even my parents said that I should try to keep the peace and offer to check into the administrative procedures to change my name, but I really don't want to. My fiancé is conflicted. He grew up in a town where it was very, very uncommon for a woman not to take her husband's name, and he agrees that it would keep the peace with his family, but he does not want to force me and says that it's my decision. Am I the jerk here? Update. I didn't expect this to blow up at all. Thank you everyone for your input. I stayed up until 3am last night to read all your comments, and I'm relieved to know that I was in the right. To the people not understanding why I was doubting myself, I was a very confrontational person when I was younger, but after bad stuff happening with close people, I learned to keep my mouth shut. Moreover, his parents never behaved like this with me, and when my parents and my fiancé actually agreed a little with them, so no one was on my side, I started doubting my approach. I realize now that I've become too kind, and that I let people walk over me, and that I need to call them on their BS more. As for my fiancé, we had a long conversation about this this morning. He was very defensive at the beginning, saying that his parents probably didn't mean it and blah blah blah. But after explaining my side of things and showing him the messages they sent, he actually realized that they were completely out of line. He admitted that they never behaved like that with him either, and that he was so surprised by their attitude that he didn't know how to react. I've shown him some of your comments, and he understands now that he has to set clear boundaries because it's the first of many fights if he does not. He promised me that he was going to send them a message today saying that this kind of behavior would not be accepted and that they needed to apologize to me if they wanted to come to our wedding. He apologized profusely and I want to trust him. We also discussed the topic of name again and he promised me that he was fully supporting my decision. Concerning kids, we already had a conversation because we both want to be parents and we agreed to give them his last name. Again, thank you all for your comments. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the in-laws? Please let us know. Nothing's worse than in-laws who try to control things they have no right to control. Entitled mother tries to change my English accent. A little bit of background. I'm from a rural area in Catalonia, Spain. Why is that important? Because my native languages are Catalan and Spanish. But until I was like 18 years old, I barely used Spanish outside of school. So my Spanish accent is let's say weird. Now, knowing that, imagine my English accent. It's not that I don't want to do it better, it's just that I can't. But still, I can talk to people and they will pretty much understand me. Now, I used to work as a waiter in a fancy, but pretty much always empty restaurant in my town. We used to have clients from all over and I was the only one who could speak enough English so I'd be the one taking their orders. I was quite happy to do that because I got to practice and most of the people were great. I had 10 German customers tip me like 5 euro each and was told to keep it for myself. Boss agreed when I told him because they were happy with me. And the best thing, they waited for my shift to end and asked me if I wanted to join them. They were awesome. Conversation probably aren't 100% accurate, but that's more or less how I remember them. But one day, entitled mom shows up with her son. I guess he was around 16 years old or so. She was the stereotypical American woman. Her way to talk, her gestures, I thought it was hilarious. Since the beginning, when she heard me talk, she put on a weird face. But anyway, I tried my best. Then, after a while of talking to them, she said, We've got Entitled Mom, we've got the nice boy, and me. Entitled Mom. Excuse me, could you speak better English? Your English is weirding my son out. Nice boy. Mom, please, looks at me. I'm sorry, you're not, looks at her, let him do his job, me, I'm sorry ma'am, that's my English, I would need to practice a lot so I could change my accent, entitled mom, but you have to know better so you can talk to us, me, excuse me, I'm sorry I don't have a better accent, but I'm trying my best, and the moment everyone was waiting for, let me speak to your manager, so I did, knowing this poor dude wouldn't understand half of what she said. Now we've got my boss. Boss, can I help you? Your employee won't speak better English to us. Boss looks at me confused and I translated for him. Entitled mom. What are you doing? 
What are you telling him? Boss, I can't help you. Sorry. He has the best English. I leave you with him. Sorry. Then he told me that if she continued like this, to let her write a complaint and let her leave. Then he goes back to the kitchen. Entitled Mom. Where is he going? Why is he leaving? What did you tell him? You just needed to speak better English and this wouldn't have happened. Me. Lady, I told you. I can't speak better English. Entitled Mom. I demand you speak better English. Me. Really ticked off. Lady, I told you. I can't speak better English. And now I need you to leave. Nice boy laughed a little bit, and then Entitled Mom grabbed her things and her son, and she left yelling not very nice things, that she wasn't paying, that she would sue us and blah blah blah. Nothing ever happened. That was it. Boss never cared about what happened, we got to eat what we didn't serve them, and we had an anecdote to tell the other waiters. As a fun fact, something similar happened a couple days after with a French couple who wanted us to speak French when anyone in the restaurant spoke French and they didn't even know a single word in English. They ended up leaving a bad review in the Spanish page, in French. Thank you for reading. I'm sure a lot of you have similar stories that I would love to know. Entitled Mom Tries to Steal My Service Dog So this just happened today, so I'm shaken up from it. I have a wonderful service dog named Frankie. She helps me with my anxiety and PTSD so that I can go into stores and shop. I have an ID for her that shows she belongs to me. So I'm shopping today looking for some clothes when I see this boy, entitled kid, running under the clothing racks and through the aisle. This gives me anxiety, and Frankie alerts me by jumping on my leg. I reward her and we move on. Entitled kid runs right in front of us and spots Frankie. Entitled kid, puppy! He goes to pet Frankie, and I step in between him, putting my hand to block him. Me, I'm sorry sir, you can't pet her, she's working, see? I motion to Frankie's vest that clearly states, Service dog, do not pet. Entitled kid starts crying and runs under the clothing racks. I try to calm myself down and I continue shopping. I then hear stomping feet coming into the aisle I'm in and I turn around to see the mom, Entitled Mom, coming towards me, Entitled Kid in tow. Karen, how dare you tell my little angel that he can't pet your dog. Let my son pet your dog now. Me, I'm sorry ma'am. My dog is working right now, and your son can't pet her. I don't care. Entitled Mom then comes up to me and grabs Frankie's leash from me. Frankie has been trained to follow a stranger in case of medical emergencies, so she just goes with the woman. Me. AC! This is an emergency call for Frankie to come right to my side. Frankie slips her harness and runs to me. I pick Frankie up, crying now. Entitled Mom. How dare you! I'm going to call the police saying you stole that dog from me. Entitled Mom then blocks me from leaving and calls the police. The police arrive and Entitled Mom starts saying that Frankie is her service dog and I stole her. I start having a panic attack and Frankie alerts me and lays on my chest to calm me down. The officer comes over and helps me calm down. When I come out of the panic attack, I explain what happened and show the ID I have for Frankie and my ID to prove it's me. Entitled Mom throws Frankie's harness and starts running away. The officer grabs her and arrests her for pet theft, assault on an officer, and verbal harassment. Frankie is okay, and I'm okay as well. I took my emergency medication, and I'm doing better now. Thank you for reading. Please treat service animals like medical equipment and do not try to pet them. Don't walk on your property? You got it. This one goes back to the previous neighborhood our family lived in. It was a really nice, quiet, horseshoe-shaped street, but it had no sidewalks. When my wife and I would walk the dogs and our kids, we would have to walk in the street. This was not a problem unless a car came and we would have the kids step aside into the grass to stay out of the street while the car passed. The neighborhood was built in the 80s and many residents are original owners. Mostly nice, but of course we have some nasty humanoids among them. One neighbor in particular seems to always have to say something mean when we go by. She's a deacon at the church my family goes to and is the type to be religious for face value only. One day in particular, she yelled at us for allowing our kids to step in her grass while avoiding a car in the road. I told her that they were just stepping aside until the car passed. She got overly angry 
and started spraying a hose at us and screaming like a banshee. We hurried the kids away and told them that they did nothing wrong, and from now on, we will walk on the other side of the street. About two weeks later, her and her husband got a new shed installed at their house and had to have the property surveyed for it. As I drove by, I noticed something. The front of the property boundary was about 10 feet back from the road. The houses on their side of the street are all a little further back. I had a friend who does surveying come out and do our property, and sure enough, our boundary was about 3 feet from the road. We did some digging through the archives at City Hall and found that the neighborhood was permitted and designed to have a sidewalk that ran the length of the horseshoe on her side of the street. The 10-foot right-of-way was designed to have curbing, grass, and then a sidewalk. So I did what any sane person would do in this situation, and I contacted the township to have a sidewalk put in. The township notified all residents of the request and held an open hearing for it during a township meeting. Most of the neighbors showed up in support of it. Most didn't care, but that nasty lady showed up to protest it and raise all heck. A month later, they began excavating for the sidewalk, and when they got to her house, she had planted a big landscape piece with flowers and shrubs and a tree right in the way. The township told her to remove it. She didn't. They fined her and removed it themselves. The best part of this story is that two weeks after the sidewalk was finished and in, we listed our house and moved to another neighborhood. She still makes nasty remarks to my mother at church and we drive by her house while visiting our old neighbors every now and then. Timesheets are due at 5 p.m. I work as a remote system engineer and I work with project managers, PMs. We have these timesheets that have a deadline of Friday at 5 p.m. And although they have a Friday deadline, the PMs don't ever start working on them until next week. Pretty pointless, but I submit mine a little early around 4 p.m. And the project manager whom I worked with really liked it as she could fill them out and get them done. So she was the only one who actually did the billing on Friday right before she left for five. So I made her life pretty easy. One day I had my son's soccer game get bumped up as they were playing two games due to rescheduling from hurricanes. So I gave my PM a heads up as I was pretty booked solid and I wouldn't have time to work on the timesheets. I told her after I got back home, I would put them in later tonight. She was like, oh, that's perfectly okay, sweetie. Cringe. I submitted the timesheet around 7, thinking all is good. I get a call from my boss, whom I will say is usually quite chill. He was telling me that the PM complained to her boss and he is hearing it. He was very nice, but told me that I must follow the company policy of timesheets being in by 5. That way, he didn't have to hear about this complaining, and I'm good. So, remember how I said I submitted them early? That courtesy has expired. The following week, I get a ping from my PM at 4.30. She is asking if I submitted my timesheet yet, as she's looking to leave a little early. I told her I did not, and I'm following the policy of getting the timesheets in by 5 p.m. What I did was I had my timesheet saved as a draft, but wouldn't actually finalize it until 4.59. I even pinged her and told her timesheet is all in, so she had to stay later as she was always insistent on doing billing on Friday. One week later, she asked me, pretty please, if I could fill out my timesheet a little earlier as she was going on PTO and was leaving early on Saturday. I'm thinking, not my problem. But I said in my happiest voice, I'll try my best. I submitted it at 4.57. Eventually, she complained to her boss. My boss talked to me and mentioned it. However, my boss said, he is technically submitting his timesheets on time and he chewed out the PM's boss. I didn't hear it, but he told me all about it. The PM eventually got fired as she was a pretty bad PM. And as I do my timesheet on a Friday, this memory pops up from time to time. Entitled Dad wants my granny-in-law's wheelchair. So, several months ago, my granny-in-law was in an accident. This was not her fault. This resulted in both her fake leg and her real leg getting broken, among other injuries. Granny is just full of rage. She's 80 years of rage, people. She had fought hard for decades over wanting to be independent and never be put in a home or become someone's burden. She wanted to live in her own home, take care of herself, and die in her own bed. Sadly, the accident made that impossible now. She'll never be able to walk under her own power again, and she's hurting herself using a walker or whatever you called those wheeled things. She wants to live at home. However, she knew she would need someone there constantly, 
and hired a day nurse and a night nurse to come take care of her. She refuses to move into any home, relatives or otherwise. Well, in an effort to get her out of the house, my wifey and I would take her out. Yes, we were being very careful about where we were taking her and going all out on masks and antibacterial everything. We tried to take her places that weren't too crowded, but also wheelchair accessible. Well, a mall that was about an hour out of town had reopened. It's a sad, sad place because many of the stores were closed and possibly would never get any new business. It was a dying building, but the food court still had excellent food. We went there today. The kids were off playing with some friends, so it was just me, wifey, my granny, and myself taking laps around the mall, taking turns on who pushes granny. Now, granny was wearing a long skirt, but didn't have her fake leg on. You couldn't really see that she had one leg unless you were looking very closely. So I can kind of understand why this entitled dad thought my granny had two legs. See, we got hungry and went to the food court to get healthy <laughs> food to eat. We pulled up to a table and started to chow down. Then entitled dad appeared. I don't even need to transcribe this part. It's a dime a dozen story about an entitled parent that wants the wheelchair that someone is currently using. We say no, she says no and cannot walk and the entitled dad demands it for his son. He was sitting at another table, looking like he was out cold. He was that tired looking. Granny finally had enough and looked at him right in the eye and said, Young man, this is my chair, which I need to move about. I don't care how tired your kid is. He cannot have it. I would not be able to walk at all. Entitled dad obviously replies, You may be old, but you don't need it at all. You can walk, you old crone. Granny got red in the face. Old crone? Looky here, little boy. I may be old, but I can still kick your butt, even if my only leg is in a bad shape. Entitled Dad scoffs at her. I bet you're only faking about having one leg. Granny looked like she was about to yell again, except she just grinned. She turned her chair to him and showed him that she was indeed missing a leg. Think I'm faking here, kid? She goes in a snide tone. Think this is a fake stump? Entitled Dad looked embarrassed and tried to talk. Granny wouldn't let him. She actually lifted up her stump a bit. Why don't you touch my stump? Come on, it might be a real stump, might be fake. Touch it and see. Touch my stump. If it's a fake stump, the chair is yours. The guy backed off and started for his table. Except Granny started to wheel after him, yelling at him. Come on, touch my stump. You know you want to. Touch it. Me and wifey were cracking up at this, so I had to be the one to grab her chair and bring her back. The entitled dad picked up his son and carried him out of there quickly. Granny was grumbling about how rude that man was, but she looked so proud of herself. A few people there within hearing range were also laughing, although two people looked disgusted at my granny-in-law. Forget them. At least that got some anger out of her system. The situation calmed her down a great deal and cheered her up. My Karen neighbor demands a cash gift for her son's graduation. Long story short, the day before yesterday, my neighbor was calling me asking me to bake 12 dozen cookies for their son's graduation celebration, which at the time of the call was in about 20 hours. She said the cake they ordered had somehow become lost in the order system and wouldn't be ready in time, that their son loves my chocolate chip cookies and it would mean the world slash save the party. I agreed to help out. I went to the store and quickly bought all of the ingredients, which for that amount of cookies came close to $300. I managed to get them all baked, arranged on trays, and set up at the party without issues until the end of the party. Mom walks up and thanks me for helping out and then asks me if I forgot to include a check in the graduation card. I calmly told her that the last minute baking marathon was my gift and said I was glad it all worked out. Mom said she appreciated my hard work, but that her son couldn't buy books for college with cookies, and that I should at least hand him some cash before I left. I left without doing so, and now the mom has texted me, asking me to apologize to her son. <laughs> Am I the jerk? Update. Thank you for all the upvotes and awards. Wow. I ended up replying to mom that the only apology that was needed was one from her for being so rude about me not giving money as my gift. She did say sorry via text, and it was just that. A single word, sorry. Hope they enjoyed the cookies, because that was the last taste they'll be getting of those. And for those asking why the cost of ingredients was so high, I did buy all new ingredients, 
flour, sugar, butter, etc. because I wasn't comfortable using up eggs that had been sitting in my fridge for a week. Also, I make these cookies a little larger than normal size, so therefore more ingredients. Yes, I chose to do them bigger, but I figured it was for a special occasion, so what the heck? Lesson learned. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you go ahead and give their son some money or not? Please let us know. Ooh, number one, never bake cookies for Karen. Manager tells me I need to know which rules to follow. When I was in grad school, about 15 years ago, I was working nights and weekends in a convenience store. It also happened to be the first time the fuel prices shot up to $4 plus per gallon in America. Because of this, there were quite a few people who pumped gas and drove off, prompting our company to institute a pay before pumping policy. The company was a small regional chain of gas stations slash convenience stores in a largely rural area. They were concerned about any loss, so much so that in the company newsletter, they announced firing someone for regular theft from the store. The theft in question was when an employee refilled her fountain drink while on duty. Another example was that we were required to do money drops anytime we had more than $200 in the cash register. Another employee was fired because she was robbed and hadn't done a money drop. There was approximately $205 in the register at the time. So when this new policy came out, I wasn't about to risk my job over someone filling up and driving off with a tank full of gas on my watch. My manager was really good about working around my needs for class, research, etc. while working on my degree. So I put up with this and wanted to keep my job. One night I'm working and someone pulls up to get gas. The machine beeps, letting me know someone is trying to fuel up before paying. I won't pre-authorize because policy. Customer comes in and demands I let him fill up before paying. I explain the policy and he lights into me with perhaps every word he knows. I'd like to say I was professional, but I returned his hospitality. The next day when I show up for work, my manager is waiting for me, clearly unhappy. He is a regular customer and we want to keep them happy. I explained to her that regular customer or not, I wasn't willing to risk my job over a drive off when people are getting fired for losing such little sums of money. Manager states, I see what you're doing, but you have to learn which rules to follow. Now she's been with the company for about 15 years. She could get some leeway. I'd been there less than a year. I had no leeway. So I asked her, please put in writing which rules I am expected to follow and which rules I am not or put in writing which customers are exceptions to policy and which ones are not. Until then, I'm following all of the company's policies. I'm not surprised that she wouldn't put that in writing. Fast forward about a week. I'm working solo on a Sunday afternoon when someone I've never seen before comes in and yells at me for not pre-authorizing his pump. I explain the company policy and that he would have to prepay just like everyone else. Customer claimed he was with corporate and that he should be allowed an exception. I informed him that if he really was from corporate, he'd know about this policy and would expect me to follow it. I even pointed to the policy statement in the window for him to read. The customer yelled at me and stormed off before I could reply. Turns out, this stranger was from corporate and even the VP of the company. He called to complain to my manager about my refusal to let him pump first. She repeated my arguments as to why I refused to risk my job and that he should be glad to know they have such loyal employees. VP said that policy was meant for regular customers and not for employees. She replied, Please put into writing which rules we are expected to follow and which ones we are not. Do you ever bend the rules at your job a little bit or not? Please let us know. I'd love to bend the rules if I had a job. Sadly, I don't and I just have to sit here and listen to you all day. Am I the jerk for not inviting a child-free friend to my baby shower? This is really dividing up my friend group, so I need all the help I can get. Sorry about any typos. I, 24 female, am 6 months pregnant. My friend decided to throw a baby shower and she asked me to get her a guest list. I invited most of my friends except Anna, who's 25, who is child free. Anna and I have known each other since college. She's always known she doesn't want kids and I don't have any problem with that. Everyone's needs and wants are different and I respect that. But Anna tends to bash having kids a lot. She doesn't talk about it always, but it tends to be something she likes to discuss. Not going to lie, I did not find it to be hurtful or wrong before I got pregnant, 
But even after all of my friends knew about my kid, Anna continued to bash having kids. She didn't outright say it, it was very subtle. Like sending articles about how having kids contributes to pollution, etc. Or saying things like, it's a bad world, why would anyone want to subject an innocent kid to this? During the first months, I thought she was just concerned, or maybe it was hard to break the habit, but she continued on, despite me telling her it's a bit hurtful. She always apologized though and seemed genuine. Last week we were out having lunch and she said something along the lines of, People get so boring after being pregnant, no offense though, because I was talking about something baby related. I barely do that because I know how some people can just go on and on about things like this. But I was talking about it that day because one of the friends there had asked us a question related to it because she and her husband were thinking about having kids themselves. I laughed it off, but it hurt me a lot. So when it came to the baby shower, I decided to not invite her. I was feeling a bit petty, I guess, which is one of the reasons why I may be the jerk. But I also don't want her saying hurtful things. I know I'm a very sensitive person and this can be annoying, but I can't change what I get hurt about. The baby shower was beautiful, but afterwards I got a call from Anna, and she was calm but angry, if that makes sense. She said she saw all of the Instagram photos, not from my account, called me selfish, accused me of trying to cut her off from the group for being child free, and things like that. I just replied about her finding baby things boring, and she hung up. A lot of other friends texted me, saying I shouldn't take everything so seriously, and should not have made Anna upset especially since we've been friends for years. So I have to know if I should work on my behavior and apologize, or if I was in the wrong. Am I the jerk? Update. My friends and I have decided that Anna is not trying to understand me at all. She's currently calling me a lot of names online like Breeder. So yeah, like a lot of people have suggested, I'm going to end this friendship and so are the others because they agree she has crossed a line too. Thank you for your help. I appreciate it so much. Well, who do you think is the jerk, OP or her friend? Please let us know. Never be friends with someone who disrespects you or your life decisions. They're honestly not worth it and they will never be. You want me to keep digging? You got it. Since lockdown started, I've been living with my sister and my parents at home. I'm pretty grateful that I get along with my parents and my sister and things have been pretty smooth sailing given the circumstances over the past year or so. That being said, my dad is pretty my way or the highway with most things, always very controlling when it comes to keeping the house clean and the backyard manicured. He bought a lawnmower, trimmer, and blower this past spring and tidies around the house probably twice a week. I love him, but darn does he need things to be clean and he will not waste an opportunity to complain about things that are messy and ask us to do mundane tasks, refill the toilet paper when we have many extra rolls, etc. I'm pretty understanding and my dad's just a little on the neurotic side, but he's just so uppity about it that it's hard not to get annoyed at. So a couple weeks back, my dad noticed the flower bed in the backyard isn't doing so hot, or rather, it's doing too hot. The trees above give pretty much normal shade most of the garden, but lets the sun absolutely bake the flower bed. Not much you can do about it, just a small quirk of the backyard landscaping. My dad can't look at that without thinking, this needs to be solved. But instead of planting a sun-loving plant, he decides it's the soil's fault. Somehow, he makes the connection that the soil might have been salted by accident or something. And my dad asks me to dig out the dying flowers, clean out the soil, put in new soil, and replant the same dying flowers. I'm a bit confused because it's pretty obvious the sun is the problem. But once my dad decides he's solved a problem, it's solved. So after a bit of an argument, I cut my losses, except that I'm living here rent free and go clear the soil, repot the flowers and give them a nice watering. One week later and the flowers are dead. My dad gets in his head that somehow I didn't get rid of the old salty soil and after some more arguing over how the sun works, I'm off to Home Depot for more flowers and soil to plant new flowers in new soil. The next batch holds for maybe two weeks until the inevitable heat death of the flower bed comes about and my dad is left with a second batch of crisp flowers. Yet again, it's my fault for not getting rid of that darn salty soil. So he says, Big Chip, do not stop digging until you get rid of every last inch of old soil. Here's the thing, some of our flower beds are placed over canvas fabric, which separates it from the ground soil. 
a geotextile fabric to keep things level, which is what my dad thought I was digging down to. This flower bed was not one of them. There is no bottom. My dad leaves to go for a bike ride and I start digging and keep digging, still digging. Lunch, back to digging. My mom and sister decided to chill outside with me. My mom telling me that this was ridiculous and my sister cheerleading me forward. My dad gets back home before dinner and I'm about waist deep in an eight foot long by four foot wide pit with a huge ring of soil around the edges. Dirt all over the backyard. He barges over, smoke coming out of his nostrils, yelling at me about how I'm destroying his garden, asking what the heck I'm doing. I just said, well, I don't think I can get rid of all the old soil, but a couple more days of this and I think we'll be pretty safe. My sister starts laughing and my dad has absolutely no recollection of his words until my sister has to remind him of what he said. Looking forward to tomorrow, when my dad's gonna have to help me refill the pit and come with me to a local garden center to pick out some sunflowers. Am I the jerk for banning my stepdaughter's husband from my house for ruining my daughter's proposal? My son-in-law, Jerry, stepdaughter's husband, claims to be a jokester. He makes fun of every situation and always taunts and teases. He used to be funny, but now he's just parroting internet memes and cliche jokes about everyone around him uncomfortable. He and my younger daughter, 22, are always in disagreement. She thinks he's not funny and he thinks she's unbearable. My daughter's fiance said he wanted to help us help him set up a surprise proposal after dinner. So everyone gathered at our house and my daughter had no idea as well as my stepdaughter and Jerry. We had my daughter put a blindfold on and walked into the living room where her fiance was getting ready to propose. Jerry saw this and said, What? <laughs> Are you people serious? Oh my God. <laughs> Everyone was looking at him with question marks over their heads. My stepdaughter said nothing. He kept laughing and I told him to knock it off as I helped my daughter walk into the room. Once my daughter was seated, Jerry started making comments as the event progressed. Her fiance pulled out the ring box. Jerry said, No, man, go find another pond. Fish ain't good here. Fiance got on one knee in front of my daughter and opened the box. Jerry said, Darn, that looks expensive. How much did you spend on that, you fool? I was fuming, and my daughter was clearly so upset. Fiance proposed, and my daughter removed her blindfold. Jerry kept talking over her when she said, I do, saying, Don't do this to yourself. You're too young to be dealing with this. Dude, run! I shouted, Shut up! He stopped and said he was just joking. I said he was being a disrespectful jerk to ruin the event with his jokes, then talked about how mean and nasty his jokes were and told him it was better if he shut up. Stepdaughter said it was no big deal when I offered that he leave. She swore he was just messing around and creating a playful atmosphere, but I took it seriously. But he essentially ruined my daughter's proposal. I told them I no longer want him to come over after this. He walked out, but my stepdaughter started crying to her dad calling me callous and claimed I was favoring my biological daughter and this was an excuse to ban her from her dad's house. My husband said I overreacted and shouldn't have banned him from the house knowing that's how he is and I gained nothing by this except straining my relationship with my stepdaughter. But I called him unfair to see how my daughter was treated and still sided with the others. Was I the jerk? Did I handle this wrong? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Jerry? Please let us know. Jerry the jerk. Wow, that's got a ring to it. Karen thinks that rules don't apply to her because I spend money here. This is a story about a regular Karen that comes into the store I work at. I'm a shift supervisor. She routinely is a pain and is very entitled. Her favorite thing to say to excuse her demands is, I deserve this because I spend lots of money here. This particular incident is her most insane and entitled visit to our store yet. Our store is a small store in a small mall. Karen comes in and approaches me as I'm stocking some shelves. Karen, excuse me, I need tissues. I'm very sweaty. I'm a runner, you know. Me, hi ma'am. Unfortunately, we don't have any to give to customers due to lockdown. However, there is a public restroom across the hall that is open where we can freshen up. Or you can purchase some purse tissue and wipe packs. Karen, no. I am a regular customer here. 
I've already spent enough. I don't need to buy it. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I don't have any tissue to give you. You will either have to grab some from the washroom across the hall or buy some. Karen. But I'm a runner. You really should have some available for customers like me. Karen then walked away, and I turned back to my shelf before I heard the sound of a lot of wipes being pulled from the dispenser. This occurred during the lockdown times, so we have some sanitary wipes for wiping carts at the entrance and exit of the store. I walked around the corner to see Karen pulling wipe after wipe from the dispenser and putting them into a bag. We have a store policy that is posted in the dispenser that the limit is two wipes per customer. Me. Ma'am, please, you can't take all those. Those are for customers to clean their carts with. Please stop taking so many. Karen. I've spent hundreds of dollars here. I deserve a few wipes. She then storms off further into the store, so I guess that got her to stop after all. I went back to the shelf and was left alone for around 30 minutes before I get a page to the cash. I go up to the front and I see Karen there looking upset and my cashier looking confused. Cashier. Hey, sorry to bother you, but could you check the price of this? This customer says it should be on sale. I look at the product and recognize it as a product that was on sale last week as part of a promo. Me. I'm 99% sure that this was on sale last week, but I'll go double check to make sure the tag is correct. I checked to see and the product that she wanted was not on sale. However, a smaller version was. I came back and informed her as such. Karen. No, I don't want that one. I want the big one. It was on sale last week, but I couldn't come by and get it. So can I just get the sale price now? My cashier and I look at each other before I respond. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but that's not how sales work. Do you have a rain check receipt? No, I wasn't able to come by. Just adjust the price. I spend so much here. I've paid all your wages, so just discount it for me. Me. I'm sorry, but I can't do that. The sale ended last week. You will have to come back next time it's on sale. Karen. Let me speak to your manager. I'm friends with the owner. They always give me the most recent sales price. I do as she asks and call the store manager up to the front. He comes up and hears what she has to say. To my glee, he says, Manager, the sale ended last week. You will have to come back when it's on sale again. Karen, do you realize how much I spend here? I should get this on sale with how much I spend here. This place is corrupt. Manager, I'm sorry you feel that way. Unfortunately, we cannot give you a sales price now that it's no longer applicable. Otherwise, we'd do it for everyone. Is there anything else that we can do for you? No, this is disgusting. I'm not spending that much. Karen then stormed out without buying anything. What was the product she wanted? $3.99 toothpaste that was on sale for $1.99 last week. We had a smaller size of the exact toothpaste on sale for 99 cents that week. But no, she didn't want that one. Oh great, now the next manager she yells at is going to have to smell that rancid breath. <sighs> Here to help, but not that kind of help. I work in emergency services as an EMT. Our station is in the same building that the county keeps its 911 dispatch center. On nights when things are slow for us downstairs, I'll often do a food slash coffee run to the local Flying Goose convenience store for the folks upstairs who are pounding phones and working the radios. A caffeinated dispatcher is a happy dispatcher. The folks at the shop know me since they see me on an almost nightly basis, and since they know what I do and who this stuff is for, they grant me a little more leeway than standard customers. Nothing crazy, just stuff like making coffee or grabbing the cups and supplies from the cupboards if they're out and things are busy. Little things that save us both time because they can keep doing what they're doing and I can get back out the door. This night, me and my partner stop by to put gas in the ambulance and I run inside to get everyone's food and find out they're out of coffee. No big deal. There's a large cluster of people waiting around the food counter, so instead of bothering the employees, I just get to work starting a few pots. I'm in a dark navy blue t-shirt with medic across the back and my squad number slash logo on the front and I'm wearing my portable radio. Definitely don't look anything like the store crew in their bright neon color store shirts when this happens. Entitled lady. Excuse me, but why aren't you making my sandwich? Me. Excuse me? Don't look at me like that. 
I've been standing here for 20 minutes while you were on break, and now you're going to hide over here instead of making my food? Me, laughing. <laughs> you can't be serious right now. Karen, getting shrill. You think this is funny? Well, we'll see who's laughing when I report you to your manager and get you fired. Me, you go right ahead and call him and tell him I'm refusing to make you a sandwich. His phone number is 911. At this, she just starts sputtering in indignation as I turn my back to her and go to the touchscreen to order our food. Other customers, as well as the actual employees, are laughing now as she starts trying to find someone to agree with her that I'm still wrong because I was making coffee, so how was I to know? She grabbed the next order that was called, not even hers, and stormed out in embarrassment. When I got back outside and told my partner, he laughed so hard the rig was shaking. Said some crazy lady had come out, scowled at him across the parking lot and yelled, I hope you never come to my house. And now he understood why. Entitled man refuses to move from mobility parking spot. I'm a manager at the Way of Subs and yesterday had a man park in the mobility parking space. I didn't see him park there at the time and come into our store. I'll call him Entitled Man. We were serving another customer at the time who had just started ordering an entitled man interrupted the other customer to ask what the sub of the day was. Already, this got my hackles up because he was rude about it. I then look up and notice a car parked in said parking space which is directly in front of our big glass doors. I looked at him and asked if that was his car. He said yes. Now in New Zealand, people who qualify for mobility parking permits need to get a doctor to fill in the medical part of the form and the doctor will often send the application form in for you and you just need to pay for it. I'm not sure how other countries work, but that's us. Back to the conversation. Me. Do you have a mobility parking permit? Entitled man. No, I broke my back and I can't walk that far. Me. You need a permit to be allowed to park there. Entitled man. I'm still waiting for it to come. Me. It's illegal to park there unless you have a permit. You need to move your car. I'll just get my food, then I'll move it. It's only going to take a couple of minutes. Me. No, you need to move your car now. Entitled man then plants his feet, drops his shoulders, almost like a three-year-old who's not going to do what you asked. It sucks, but we can't actually do much to make people move from those parks other than ask them to move. The tow truck would take too long, and they would already be gone by the time the tow truck gets here. I decided to say the only thing I could in this situation. They either move their car or speed out of there like a scorned lover. And yes, this happens regularly, but most people will just move their car. I did a lot of theater in high school, so I know how to project my voice without yelling. Sir, we will not be serving you unless you move your car. Well, he spun around like only someone who has an intact back could do and stomped out like a big man-child, threw himself into his car and sped off like someone was chasing him. The other customers who were in the store all had a little to say. I was about to go and move my own car. You were so intimidating. Wow, you're not going to miss the $5 he was going to spend. Good job. People like that guy tick me off. My grandpa needs those parks, so thank you for standing up to him. It makes me feel better when everyone else supports me. Am I the jerk for refusing to let my sister stay with me after how she's treated my girlfriend? My girlfriend, 30, is currently four and a half months pregnant and we're living together. My ex-wife, 32, female, and I, 30, male, just barely finalized our divorce. It was a pretty messy ending. She had an affair and we separated. Around that time, I spent more time with a close friend of mine, now my girlfriend, I've known for years. Months later, realized we had feelings and pursued a relationship. When I filed for divorce, my ex spun the story and flipped it on me. No one in my family believed her except for my sister, who's 28, and that was due to them being best friends. Throughout the whole ordeal, my sister took my ex's side, wouldn't stop bothering me about working things out with my ex since she's given me a chance, after what I did to her. She was even more vicious to my girlfriend for absolutely no reason, attacking her on social media, calling her a homewrecker. Myself and my family had to talk to her many times and I even cut contact for a while. Then, when we found out that she was pregnant, my sister's first reaction was, Congrats on your affair, baby. She texted that to me from a different number, because I have her blocked, and I knew it was her. 
A week ago, my mom told me my sister wanted to speak to me. She apologized for everything, admitted that she was completely immature and coming from a place of anger towards me because she's been with my ex as a support. She's been her shoulder to cry on, so she felt protective of her. During this same discussion, my sister mentioned needing some place to stay, so not only was she hoping we could make amends, but also wanting to know if it was possible to stay at our house. Suddenly, her apology didn't seem so sincere to me, and I said no, especially with not how she's treated my girlfriend. My mom is urging me to do this because my sister needs some place to stay, and it could be a way for her and my girlfriend to get to know each other better. And I can't blame my sister for her reaction when she was just believing my ex's lies. My sister is begging me to help her out and promises she'll be courteous to my girlfriend. My girlfriend thinks if I trust my sister, then she'll go along with what I think is best. But honestly, I don't and wouldn't want to put my girlfriend in that position. Since I've doubled down on my decision, everyone thinks I'm being too hard on her for believing someone else's lies and am now refusing to help her. I feel like suddenly I'm the only sane one here since everyone seems to be bothered by this, especially my sister who wouldn't let it go. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or their sister? Please let us know. Never let dramatic toxic family members live with you. You might not be able to get them out. Entitled ex-friend is upset about me getting a job in our field. Dave, 35 male, and I, 25 female, met in an advanced math class at community college three years ago. I had finished my bachelor's and needed to take a couple extra classes to prep for my master's program in CS. Dave, as he came to share, had spent ages 18 to 28 playing video games in his childhood bedroom, and from 29 to 35, he had had an awakening and decided to start doing something with his life. He planned on getting his bachelor's in CS, but had somehow managed to spend six plus years of taking part-time classes at the community college. The guy was 35, never had a job outside of one summer stocking at a grocery store a decade ago, never paid rent in his life either. When we met in that math class, Despite his past, I was impressed with Dave for trying to turn his life around. The guy was smart, but over time I started seeing another side of him. Dave constantly complains about his parents, the same parents who pay his every expense, including a reloadable Starbucks card and an annual Disneyland membership, the latter of which he uses two to three times each week. Anytime I ever offered to help Dave get a good starting job in IT or CS, he'd laugh and say, I couldn't possibly work, even part-time with my academic schedule, or $30 an hour? I'll be making three times that when I finish my degree. What makes him think that? His three months of job market experience from 2005? At the same time, he always went around saying he knew more than his professors did. He should just teach the class, etc. He'd tell everyone he's a computer scientist and a true academic. Well, this summer I got an internship turned job into a major tech and entertainment company. I am on track to finish my master's next year. The sad thing is, my friendship with Dave was over within two months of me getting this internship. He started calling me a sellout and saying things like working students didn't actually care about understanding computer science. They just lied and cheated to get through classes. Random crap like that. When I told him that wasn't true and that lots of students work, his response was to ignore me for a week and then write a four-page letter saying I don't understand how hard he has it. The entitlement is mind-blowing for a near middle-aged man who has never supported himself to tell someone who worked their way through most college in retail and as a maid who now works full-time and mentors kids in STEM while finishing a second degree that she doesn't appreciate how hard he has it. Mind blown. Hope he's still having a good time spending 40 hours a week studying and being a computer scientist at Starbucks. Karen's stepmom tries to make rules for my kids in my own home. I share two sons, 11 and 7, with my ex. He left me for his wife three years ago. They got married right after the divorce. I mention this because there are some tensions present due to this and also due to the fact that my former in-laws and I got along so well and have not been welcoming towards ex's new wife. So anyway, ex and his wife put the boys in football and a church thing on their time. X actually signed them up for all the time, but neither boys like these activities. X says in his house they must do them. I say fine, but they won't do them with me. X's wife is the one with the biggest issue with my decision. She's very religious and believes that the boys should play sports and attend church. About a week ago, my oldest was picking up a certificate from one of his chosen extracurricular activities, and me, 
ex and his wife were there, while ex's parents and sisters were outside waiting to celebrate. Ex's wife starts telling the boys that they need to do the church thing that Saturday afternoon whether they like it or not, which was my parenting time, not ex's, and that they need to sign up for some other stuff for football, which also fell on my parenting time. When we go outside, without the boys, they were with X. I told her she did not get to make rules or demands in my home, and she better not do that again the way she did. X's family backs me up and says she's not their parent, etc. She gets super upset at me for doing that around them, and then when X finds out, he tells me that I'm the jerk, and I should have waited and discussed it after. I told him I only care about the boys not hearing, and that he needs to nip that crap in the bud if he doesn't want stuff like that to happen again. She told me I made it even harder for their family to get along now, and I should be ashamed. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the new stepmom? Please let us know. New stepmom doesn't get to make the rules in your home. Someone need to put that Karen in check. Entitled dad wants to bend airport security rules, gets detained by the police. So, if you can't tell from my username, I'm a pilot. Specifically, my job is to fly an air ambulance airplane, and 90% of the time, it's an awesome job. The other 10% is the type of stuff you expect that brings a job down, such as hours, paperwork, new guidelines, and the sad stuff that goes with being in a field related to medicine. Last week, however, was an experience that made me wonder how some people are able to even remotely function in society. I was at an airport in a smaller city that handles both small airline flights as well as private flying such as flight training and corporate flights. I'm waiting with the aircraft while the flight nurses are at the hospital getting the patient ready for the trip. Part of my duty is making sure the plane is cooled down and ready to go the moment that the ambulance arrives with the patient. As such, I'm out walking around the plane doing checks and just visiting with pilots and the support personnel on their ramp. While out there, this guy pulls up at the chain link fence of the airport about 80 feet away and gets out of his car with his son, who appears to be about 10 or so. He starts yelling at us to come over. Okay, people in aviation are actually pretty friendly for the most part, and the kid hanging on the airport fence is something many of us were in our younger days. Myself and a pilot of a jet parked nearby walked over to the guy and his kid. Big mistake. The guy starts out by saying he was former military and wanted to fly, but his eyes are bad so he went door gunner in a helicopter. He's saying things and making claims that have my BS flag flying at full staff. Oh well, whatever, we remain cordial and ask the son if he's interested in flying. He is shy but says he is and wants to fly fighter jets. The other pilot turned out to be a retired A-10 pilot, so he starts chatting up with the kid. The father, therefore, is talking to me, entitled Dad. So, what do you fly? Me. That air ambulance right over there. Cool. How fast does that go? Me. Average speed is around 250 to 275 miles per hour. Uh, would you be able to give us a ride? We will pay for gas. Me. Sorry, company policy says I can't. Plus, I'm waiting for a patient. Can the other guy take us? Other pilot. No, my jet is privately owned and we only fly the owner and his family. That's BS. Y'all have seats. Just take us for a quick flight. My kid wants to be a pilot. Other pilot. Sorry, we can't. Plus, you have to go through TSA to come onto the ramp and they will want you to have a pass. I'm not leaving until one of you gives us a ride. At this point, the other pilot and I walk away back to our planes. This guy gets in his car and drives over to the vehicle access gate, remotely manned from inside the building, and basically parks his car in front of it. A TSA agent walks out and tells the guy he needs to leave. Entitled Dad just locks the doors and rolls up the windows. About five minutes into this, I get the text that the ambulance has left the hospital and is on the way. Soon after, a police car pulls in behind the guy and starts to question him. Because of all of this, the ambulance had to be let through another gate and then escorted across the airport. I was told that the threat of arrest was enough to get compliance, but the guy still got a trespassing notice, as well as a citation for impeding an emergency vehicle. Wish the kid all the best. With a father like that, he will have a hard road. Speaking of airplanes, when was the last time you went on an airplane, and where did you go? Please let us know.
I flew to a Karen convention about a year ago. I haven't been the same since. The time I got mistaken for a bouncer. I moved out really soon after turning 18. Not because I didn't like my parents. I love them, but they raised four kids, so they deserved some quiet time at home. I moved from the country to a big city. At first, it was a culture shock, but I adapted to it. A friend of mine working as a security guard slash bouncer, he worked at a club in town. It wasn't a total high society thing, but it wasn't all crappy either. One night, my then roommate dragged me partying. I'm not really into clubbing, but what the heck. I went out to have a smoke and to call someone. Smoking wasn't allowed inside. My bouncer buddy saw me and then I chilled with him, smoked and had a chat. He then went away to go to the bathroom, so I lit my second cigarette and tried to make my call. I was approached by what seemed to be a mother-daughter duo, or maybe aunt and niece, I don't know. But the girl was maybe like 18 or 19 and the woman was in her early to mid 40s. Both were clothed not very nicely, and especially the older woman screamed midlife crisis. Middle crisis lady. Hey, excuse me. She waves her hands to get my attention. Me. Huh? I slipped my phone in my pocket. So, we waited at least half an hour. No crap, we were waiting 45 minutes. Me. So? Her. So, maybe you could bring us in. Oh, I got it. She mistook me for a bouncer. Okay, the bouncers were in black jackets with security written in big white, reflecting letters on the back of the jacket and in little on the right side of the chest. And they had one of those earplugs for a radio in their ears so that they can be called if they needed inside. I was in a black bomber jacket, an ACDC shirt, black pants, and a pair of combat boots. Me. Uh, I think this is a misunderstanding. Oh no there isn't. Sure you can let us skip the line. But what if you just look the other way? She started touching my jacket, and I guess trying to be flirty. Sorry, not my thing. And we slip in. We just want to do clubbing, and I bet you need some ladies in there. She then slipped a banknote in my pocket. Younger Karen. Look, clubs need some girls, so guys buy drinks, right? Me. Sorry, I'm not working here. Older lady. Oh, come on. I know a bouncer when I see one. I'm long enough in this clubbing scene. I know you're afraid of what your boss might say. I was 21. Yeah. She then proceeds to try to flirt with me. But I know him. It's Frank, right? He's a friend of mine. Tell him I slipped in. Now my buddy came back from the toilet, raised an eyebrow when he saw me. The younger one looked at my buddy and her eyes widened. My buddy, wearing the security jacket, wore black leather gloves and had a plug in his ear and an ID card hanging around his neck. She then whispered to the older one, she's looking at my buddy and gets red in the face. Both then retreated to the back of the line. He asked me what happened and I told him and we had a laugh. I pulled the banknote out of my pocket and this lady gave me 100 euro. I went back in the club and bought me and my friends some beers. Thanks for beers and my groceries the next day. You're too slow. For context, I, undergrad student who commutes to uni, have been studying at home since March 2020 due to lockdown and subsequently uni shutting all the campuses down. Because of this, we haven't had access to the uni library. A lot of the books and journals we needed were behind paywalls online and some primary documents that aren't online at all. Fast forward to a few weeks before this year's final exams. Uni sends out email saying the library is now open again and has bookable study space. I book a space so I can access the resources again to study for my exams. Get into uni, no problem. Sit down and begin to study. But after 10 minutes, librarian walks in and comes over to me. What are you doing here? I booked a study space for today. These spaces are only for people who need them. Look around the completely empty library and ask to be allowed to stay, seeming as no one else is there. Librarian says I have to leave in 20 minutes. Go back a few days later, but only to borrow some books to study at home instead. As I'm going to the relevant shelves to collect my books, librarian approaches me again. What are you doing? Collecting some books to borrow? I told you you're not allowed to be here. Begins to rant about how I'm at risk of getting sick, while being right in my face, etc. I try to explain that we were told we are allowed to come and borrow books again for our exams, even show the email on my phone, and that I'm following all of the regulations, mask, distancing, even had a quick PCR test the day before. 
Also note that the library is empty again, and there's nobody on the entire campus apart from the receptionist, library, and a couple of chemistry students. Not good enough for librarian, however, who tells me that I'm too slow, and that unless I run in, grab the books, and get out, I shouldn't come back to the library. Cue malicious compliance. Put some joggers on, lace up my trainers, and make my way to uni to return books after my exams. Scan my ID, walk past the receptionist, put my bag down, and take books out. Three, two, one, go. Dash through the corridors. Half the lights are off because no one is on campus anymore. Up the stairs, swing the library doors open, and start weaving in between the shelves. Librarian yells, hey, but I don't turn to look. Get to the corner, sling the books in the return bin, and bolt back out before the librarian even gets up from behind the desk. Make my way back downstairs, grab my bag, walk calmly past the receptionist wishing them a nice day, and leave campus. Apparently, the librarian went ballistic and filed a bunch of complaints, but surprisingly, nothing came back to me. I've since discovered that this librarian complains about students all year, so complaints about me must have just been ignored by management. I wouldn't usually pull a stunt like this, but this year has been really hard academically, and we've been largely ignored by the uni. I was just trying to study to pass my exams, so I didn't appreciate someone like this librarian being so insensitive. Answers to a few recurring questions. 1. Managed to get most of my assignments done this year with whatever resources I could find on the uni database, JSTOR, etc. But many of the specific books on our reading lists had not been uploaded to the uni database, and we only have access to a few portals, such as Open Athens, which have been nonetheless very useful. For the exam in particular though, we needed a myriad of other books by specific academics, only a few of which we could access online. That's why I was trying to use the uni library as soon as it opened again. Also, a lot of comments here have given me some great advice on how to widen my access to online books and articles, which I'm very thankful for. 2. Many of you have suggested complaining about this librarian, which did initially cross my mind. However, earlier in the year, everyone on my course made an even bigger complaint about not having lectures for certain modules, lack of feedback, lack of info on upcoming exams, etc. But our head of course essentially told us to go away, so I didn't think an individual complaint from me was even worth it. 3. I have no idea why the uni library was empty, but I think it was a combination of me being there in the morning, having to commute to get there, it only opening recently, and perhaps because of some restrictions going on that I ran into myself. 4. The spaces between the bookshelves were very tight. As I was in constant movement, I didn't look back to see if I had knocked any books over but I did hear a loud rattling a few times. Am I the jerk for not returning an engagement ring? So, me and my fiancé dated for about five years. Last December, on our fifth year anniversary, he proposed to me and I accepted. In my country, engagement rings are not a major thing. Couples show that they are engaged by wearing their future wedding rings on their right hand. Once they're married, they start wearing it on their left hand. Because I always watched men proposing to women with wedding rings on American movies, internet videos, TV shows, and other media, I always had that same ideal in my head. Knowing this dream of mine, and since his family doesn't have any heirlooms or family jewels, he had a goldsmith craft a wedding ring specifically for me. He knew I didn't like fancy and flashy jewels. I'm a very discreet person, so he had a ring made for me that was exactly what I'd like. And I did. I absolutely adore it. Sadly, a couple of months ago, my fiancé fell ill and passed. I'm not going to go into details about it, because just writing this out makes me sob. I'm still very much not over it. Skip a few weeks, and his sister and his mom, I never really got along with neither the sister nor the mom, but we were friendly towards each other, called me asking for my engagement ring. They said that since we never got married, our wedding was scheduled for early 2022, and never will, I should give the ring to the real family since it represented a promise that will never be fulfilled. I told them no. Don't get me wrong, if it were a family jewel or family heirloom, I'd not hesitate to give it back. But it isn't. He had it made specifically for me, and I'll be keeping it, because he gave it to me on our fifth year anniversary together. Now they've gone to my parents, who they've talked to like twice in all the five years me and fiance were together. To all their community friends, some of which I share, telling them I'm appropriating the property that doesn't really belong to me anymore. My parents are on my side, 
Community friends are divided. Some say the ring is rightfully mine. Some say that it was a symbol of a contract that fell through due to sad circumstances and that I should give it back, that I'm keeping one of their son's property and that it should stay with his sister to pass along to her future kids. I keep saying no, but they've been so insistent that I'm starting to second guess myself. So, am I the jerk for not giving the ring to them? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the in-laws? Please let us know. Those in-laws are sick people to pester her like that. They sound like they don't have souls, to be honest. You want that invoice paid? So, for starters, I live in a small village where pretty much everyone knows who's who. I like it a lot. It gives me a sense of security that I feel is underrated in today's society. Friends and neighbors help each other out with moving, remodeling, etc. My mother-in-law wanted to have her driveway redone. Being the good son that I am, I ordered supplies and got some friends and family members to come and help out on a Saturday, after which there would be some nice cold beers. This is before lockdown, obviously. One of my friends, let's call him John, is more of an outlier and doesn't get around too much. He's a bit timid, but otherwise a very nice guy. I thought it would be a nice idea to include John in the working party, so he would get to know more folks from the village. With the work done and the driveway finished, we thanked everyone that helped for the much appreciated effort. Not too soon afterwards, I receive a letter. It was an invoice sent by John for the hours he worked, multiplied by a not too shabby hourly rate. To say I was dumbfounded would be an understatement. It's well known that this kind of work is for free. You scratch my back, I scratch yours, or so I thought. I come by John's a few days later to ask him what the invoice is all about. He says it's no big deal and that he has done it before. He can't be expected to give up his Saturday to work on somebody else's driveway. He says he thinks this is fair and that he wants to be open about it. I soon understand that John isn't going to change his mind and I don't want to get into an argument with him. I pay John myself because I'm rather embarrassed to tell my mother-in-law. A few weeks later, we're at a get-together where John happens to be too. A friend who had also helped says he's thinking of redoing his driveway as well and asks what the costs were. My mother-in-law sums up the different supplies and their costs, as well as the beers of course. John is within hearing distance and I see him glance over. Now is my time. I raise my voice a little and I say, aren't you forgetting the labor costs? She looks at me surprised and I add, yeah, you know, John's invoice of X amount? That racks up the bill. An uncomfortable silence descends upon the party as people frown and look at me and John, whose stature shrivels under the weight of those looks. Suffice to say, John had some explaining to do, but he didn't look so sure anymore. He wanted to be open about it, right? Under the circumstances, I must say the invoice was money well spent, although I lost a friend that day. Edit. A. In the end though, it's all a big misunderstanding which I tried to clear out by speaking to John about it, at which point I explained the point of scratching each other's back to him, especially in a town like ours. But then he persevered and doubled down and I decided to act in the manner I described. B. John was not new to town, just new to my group of friends and family. C. John is not a contractor, but he has useful do-it-yourself experience. Parking Break one of the reasons my marriage works is that my husband and I have very similar opinions most of the time. One of the notable exceptions to this is the parking brake. When I learned to drive, I was taught to use the parking brake every time I parked. Once I got my license, I learned that not everyone actually does that. I made a conscious decision to continue to use the parking brake for every park. It's better to use it when it's not needed than to forget it when it is needed. Also, building the habit of taking the brake on and off means I'm less likely to end up driving around with the parking brake on and eventually needing an expensive repair. My husband only uses the parking brake when he parks on a very steep hill. Parked on any hill, he turns the steering wheel so that if the car rolls, it will roll into the curb. He actually does what a lot of people do, including my driving instructor. He turns the wheel, then lets the car roll until it's touching the curb. He claims this is extra safe. I don't think it's any safer than just turning the wheel. Tires are expensive and it's unnecessary to put wear and tear on them to leave them smashed up against a curb. We've come to an agree to disagree about the parking brake. He sometimes grumbles a little when he drives a car that I drove earlier and has to remember to take the brake off, but it's not really any kind of a big deal. Well, my stepdaughter learned to drive. Her dad has been the main driving instructor, but with his blessing because I'm not her actual parent, 
I've done some driving instruction too. The first time the emergency brake came up, we explained that her dad and I had different habits about how we use the parking brake. We told her that for simplicity, while she was learning, she should do it dad's way. But when she's out driving on her own, she'll eventually develop her own habits. This was about a year ago. Today, my stepdaughter drove and it was the first time she parked on a hill by a curb. It was a slight hill, but definitely a hill. She parked by the curb and asked if she should use the parking brake. At the same time, I said yes and her dad said no. He instructed her to turn the wheel and let the car roll into the curb and that that was good enough. I let him finish this instruction. When we got out though, I said that I prefer to use the emergency brake and not press the tires against the curb. I didn't say his way was wrong, I just shared that I do the same parking job a different way than her dad does it. This is a normal thing we've done throughout her learning to drive. Well, I don't know. My husband must have gotten up on the wrong side of bed because he got a little salty and said, Maybe you should read the driver's manual and see what it says about parking. I was a little annoyed, but I was going to let it drop. However, once we got where we were headed and I had a minute, I thought I should do just that. We currently live in a different state than the one I learned to drive in, and I've never read the driver manual for this state. I have no idea what the laws or suggestions about parking brakes are. So I pulled up the state manual on my phone and looked at the section on parking. Boom, right at the top. You should use your parking brake every time you park. In the section on hill parking, it says to turn the wheel, but doesn't say to roll your car until the tire is up against the curb. I showed this to my stepdaughter and she found it hysterical, especially since her dad did learn to drive in this state. From his dad, who was a retired cop, although he also rarely uses his parking brake. My husband just rolled his eyes at me. I went on to tell my stepdaughter that the most important thing is to secure her car in some way when she parks on a hill. Her dad and I are both good drivers and as she gets more experience, she'll figure out the things that make the most sense to her. Well, what about you? Do you use the parking brake every time you park or not? Please let us know. I always do. One's usage of the parking brake directly correlates to their level of intelligence. Girl who's never spoken to me asks for answers to our final. This happened last semester. Out of nowhere, I got a message on Canvas from a girl in my class while I'm out and about. I don't recognize her, just the name, but I figure it's just her asking about homework or something. No big deal, I'd check it later. So I get home and open it up. She said, Hey, have you taken the exam yet? And then, in the hour that I didn't reply, she sent the question mark. I messaged her back and said that I had. She replies almost instantly, saying that she's stressed and that she wants my help with it. Now, I'm definitely towards the top of all my classes, but I didn't talk in the Zoom meeting and I don't know this girl, so I have no clue why she was asking me for help. But whatever, help a girl out, you know? I message back that it's not graded yet and I can't see the questions anymore, but that it was all stuff from the notes and that it's open book, and I said that she'd have time to look up her answers first. That's what I did. She then asks if I can FaceTime her while she takes it so I can just give her the answers. Again, please keep in mind that she's sending these on a school platform. I have terrible anxiety, so FaceTiming anyone is out of the question, especially to help a girl I don't know cheat on a test. I was away from my phone when she sent that reply, and by the time I checked, there was no way she was getting my help. Every hour I didn't answer her, she sent me a follow-up question mark message, totaling in a three or four question marks. I bet she was putting in more work to get me to help her than she was putting into studying. I didn't reply after that. I found out later that she was a college basketball player, so that explains some of the entitlement. Edit. Our final was available for a week. She sent me all of these within 24 hours of the due dates. Edit 2. Thank you to everyone who commented. I'm disappointed at how often this seems to happen, but I'm glad there's a community on here for sharing these frustrating experiences. Edit 3. Y'all, I had no idea you'd enjoy this story so much. I'll have to post my other soon. Thank you for the love and the awards. She did do what he asked her to do, technically. My dad frequently took my two older brothers, the only boys, out camping. He was former military and really into that kind of thing. Between scouts and at least one to two times a summer, it seemed they were frequently gone. So once my mom planned an at-home spa day for me and my three sisters, she worked full time but it was my dad's job that paid the bills. My mom was not a girly girl, but she was planning on going to the dollar store and spending $20, $4 each person, 
on nail polish, hair clips, and accessories for girls ranging from 16 to 8-ish. My dad gave her a standard lecture about how they're broke and it wasn't needed, and we, the girls, didn't even like that kind of thing, although she had already told us and we were all looking forward to it. So, like many things, dad didn't see the need for it, so it didn't happen. But he would frequently spend over $50 each for snacks and food for the boys each camping trip in addition to taking them to a local buffet on their way home. All told, with site fees and gas, over $250 a trip. My mom wasn't having it this time when my dad had left her a note with the supplies he needed her to pick up for the trip. Typically, this wasn't a problem as she worked at a local school so she got out by 3 or 4 and had a 45 minute commute one way, but she wasn't excited to be spending money to allow my dad to spoil the boys after just getting a lecture on overspending just the night before. Now, she tried not to let the kids suffer from their fights, so she got their food, with one malicious compliance. My dad had asked her to pick up two bags of marshmallows for s'mores, which she did. When he got to the marshmallow site and unloaded the camp food, he noticed two half-sized bags of mini marshmallows, and to make it more of a forget you, they were flavored and did not work with s'mores. When my dad got back, he asked her about it, and she simply replied, they were cheaper and on sale. We never did get our spa day, but my dad was more open to the occasional splurge when he was out of town. He also cut back his own spending and only took the boys to the buffet on the way home if they were going to be later or coming from out of state. Edit. He wasn't doing this because the boys deserved spoiling and we didn't. He did it because of scouts and it taught skills he thought they could use. As a former military man, he was into, this will help you later in life. My mom barely wore makeup so it never occurred to him that this was a need versus a desire. He didn't see how to justify the expenses and we were super poor. That's just the way his mind worked. Am I the jerk for giving up on having a relationship with my sister? My sister, 25, and I, female, 23, were best friends our whole lives and did everything together. A year after she started dating her now husband, who's 33, she moved out to be closer to him. Her husband is one of those guys who debates everyone about everything. The way it comes off to me is that he's never looking for a common ground or solution to an idea or a problem. He just wants to make you feel stupid. We very rarely had conversations where I walked away seeing him in a positive light. While they were dating, she would consistently come to me crying because he spoke rudely to her, offended her, spoke down to her. After every fight, she seemed resolved to break up, but they never did. Despite having only dated for one semi-tumultuous year, they decided to get married. My mother objected to this decision and asked if they would at least wait a year because we needed more time to get to know him and hopefully like him. Very little effort was made to get us all together and bond. Also, my mom preferred that my sister graduated college first before tying the knot. They refused to wait and my mother was uninvited to the wedding. It's been a year since they've been married and my sister has tried to reach out and reconnect. We all spent three days trying to talk it out and heal things. Every time we speak to her, things go well. After we hang up with her, she calls back saying her husband doesn't like what happened, he's furious and we need to talk again. So we go over everything again and it's like he refuses to let us back into her life. They subscribe to a form of Christianity that we weren't raised with. They believe that the husband gets to decide everything in their lives, including whether or not she's allowed to come visit us. After I patched things up with her again, he called me back and said I was no longer allowed to call her phone. If I wanted to speak to her, I had to call his phone and ask for her. I ask him what he wants and he says things like, I want you to respect our union. I don't know what that means. Then he said, you can't have a good relationship with her unless you have a good relationship with me. We are one. So I'm supposed to pretend to like him, I guess? It's like a hostage situation. I can tell my dad wants me to open myself up to all this drama again just because she's my sister, but I feel like it doesn't matter what I do. Her husband will always say I can't have a relationship with her and honestly, I like her less because she's allowed this to happen and won't stand up for us. Am I the jerk? Edit. I forgot to clarify that in our last two conversations, I told her that I care about her and that she can contact me whenever she needs to get away from him. Karen refused to clean up our mess, so I tried to get her fired. My wife and I were out of town getting ready to celebrate Father's Day, which is tomorrow. Anyway, my parents' house was already packed with relatives gathering for the occasion and there was no way we were going to sleep on the floor in a house full of people. So my wife and I ended up going to a hotel in the area not too far away from my parents' house. So we booked a room and spent a couple of nights there. My wife was feeling ill all day yesterday, 
and ended up throwing up twice. Second time, she couldn't get to the bathroom in time, so it happened near the bed. She had a big dinner, despite feeling sick, and well, the carpet was an absolute mess. The bed sheets caught some of it as well. I immediately called the hotel's housekeeper. She was so young, I think around 19 to 28 years of age, to come and clean up. She took forever before finally arriving. She looked shocked upon discovering that it was throw up that she had to clean up and looked up at me and said, Ew, gross, and asked if I called her to clean that. I said yes. She complained that I didn't tell her she had to clean this stuff up and said that she was sorry, but she wouldn't come near that. I was confused and I told her that she could get someone else to do it instead, but she replied that if she asked others to do her job for her, then they would hold it over her head. She then tried to hand me the tools to do it myself while she waited from a distance. I said, absolutely not. She replied, it was my wife's throw up, so I shouldn't react the way I did. I saw my wife looking at me. I flipped out and told her it's her job that she gets paid for. I said I was going straight to the hotel manager for poor service and she starts freaking out, begging me to let it go. I told her to get out, but she kept whining about getting possibly fired this time and said her dad won't be happy on Father's Day if she loses her job. My wife felt sorry for her and wanted to clean it up herself, but I insisted she gets rest. I spoke to the manager who apologized and sent an older housekeeper, but I still left a bad review on the hotel. We checked out this morning and my brother was able to find us another hotel. My wife says she couldn't help but think about that young lady who I called the manager on for having a natural reaction to throw up that she couldn't control. I said that she's a housekeeper and she should expect to do these kinds of things. My wife thinks I was too hard on her and shouldn't have overreacted and potentially got her fired. I couldn't help but think about what she said. So, am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the housekeeper? Please let us know. Bruh. Entitled friend learns to choose their words carefully. Backstory. I had a friend who we'll call Josh, which is obviously not his actual name. Josh and I had been friends since we were young. Turns out, liking Transformers, wrestling, and Hot Wheels makes it really easy to make friends in elementary school, or primary school for those on the other side of the Atlantic. Josh originally was a pretty good guy, but his parents had issues with one another and eventually split up. His mother remarried and his stepfather began to spoil Josh rotten. Josh began to become a lot more antagonistic and we grew distant as the years went on, but I tried to remain friendly with him, hoping he'd eventually see the error of his ways. He went through multiple relationships, all of them ending by his hand, but I was unaware as he only spoon fed me information and made the other party look like they were in the wrong. The Incident Josh had recently had a breakup with a girl who we'll be calling Megan, who I was friendly with before the breakup. Whilst I was worried about Megan due to us being friends, I stupidly decided to check on Josh first. Now, I had let Josh borrow stuff from me, including multiple gaming consoles, clothes, and even a few bits of furniture. I tried to be a good friend, but I didn't know that I was being taken advantage of. We had decided to order some pizza, and Josh had unwittingly ordered from Local Pizza, where Megan worked. Local Pizza doesn't deliver. Josh persuaded me to go and get the pizza. In reality, he basically demanded it because he was too lazy to drive that way. I decided to bite the bullet and just drive my way to the Local Pizza and walked inside. Lo and behold, I met with Megan, who was on break at the moment. Megan and I spoke about things and the topic of Josh came up. It was busy and our order wasn't even done yet, so I didn't mind stopping to chat until Megan began to tell me her side of things. It turned out Josh had been a major jerk to Megan until Megan's brother, Drake, stepped in and pulled his sister out of the relationship. Drake had been a friend as well, but Josh had fed me lies, so I stopped speaking to Drake. I didn't want to believe Megan at first until she called Drake, who corroborated her story. It was a lot to swallow. Josh's breakups began to make a lot more sense now, and I felt sick. Was I friends with a horrible person? I asked Megan some questions, and she told me her side of the story and ended up calling out a lot of Josh's flat-out lies. After the pizza was done, I promised Megan that I'd talk to Josh about this as someone who'd been close to him for years. 
She thought that maybe I'd be able to get through to him. Oh, were we both wrong. I got back to Josh's and just spoke about things until I managed to get on the topic of Megan. I mentioned to him that we spoke and what she had said. Big mistake. He got angry and called Megan a lying jerk and declared that I shouldn't believe her. I told him that Drake corroborated her story and that I was going through a lot of stress trying to make heads or tails of all of this. Josh, now absolutely livid, screams at me. Shut up! Get out! You want to believe them? Take your stuff and go. I was shocked. I tried to say something, but Josh cut me off. I said get out. Take your stuff and get out of my house. You want to believe her and that stupid brother of hers? Fine. Tell everyone how much of a horrible person I am. Let's see who believes you. Malicious compliances. Yep, you read that right, dear reader. Compliances, plural. Now, whilst I'm not a big fan of confrontation, I also despise being yelled at. He wants me to take my stuff and go? So be it. I just give him an, okay, Josh, I'll take my things and go. So I began to take it all back. Gaming consoles, clothes, and I even grabbed the stand-up mirror I'd let him borrow ages ago. He tried to stop me multiple times, but I simply pushed past him and reiterated his words. He wanted me to shut up, grab my things, and go. So I did. PS2 I let him borrow? Taking that back. GameCube he borrowed so he could play some games he got at a thrift store. That's mine. Taking that home. I took everything that was mine, packed it into my car, and ignored him as he screamed, ranted, and raved at me, threatening to call the police. I simply dared him to, as I was only taking back my things. When I left, I called Megan and Drake and told them what happened. They said they had my back in case things went awry after this. Then I let them in on the second thing he said. Tell everyone how much of a horrible person I am. Okay, Josh, bet. Megan, Drake, and I went through our contacts for anyone who knew Josh and told them what happened. One of these people was Josh's own mother, who was absolutely livid at him as Josh was living in his home on his mother and stepfather's dime. The Fallout Josh's reputation pretty much collapsed out from under him as evidence came to light, and Josh's various exes, emboldened by Megan and Drake coming out with their stories, began to spread their own stories on what had happened. Josh's friend circle turned on him rather quickly, finding out how much of a jerk he actually was. What made all of this worse for Josh was all of these stories had evidence, such as text, camera footage, and audio recordings, all of this evidence making it obvious that those Josh heard weren't lying. Josh's mother and stepfather ended up pulling his sizable allowance due to this, and he couldn't afford his home, so he was forced to move back in with them. Josh and I still don't talk anymore, and he had to sell off a lot of his furniture and personal possessions to pay off the debt he had managed to rack up after his allowance was pulled. I've heard that Josh has changed and is getting better, but after this crap he put me through, I'd rather be keeping my distance. Your contract is almost up. You should start looking for other jobs. First, a little background story. Doug works for one of the larger banks here in Canada. For someone without post-secondary, he's done incredibly well for himself. He's 28 now and has been working with this bank for almost nine years. He started as a teller and worked his way all the way up to just below a branch manager, but more customer service oriented. This story starts February 2020, right as lockdown was starting to snowball here. Doug had worked in a few different branches over the years and is quite personable. When a former colleague told him about a position in the wealth department, he thought it might be a good for a change. It was also work from a small office downtown, which meant he didn't have to go into a branch every day and deal with customers and employees face to face. He decided to apply. With a good recommendation, he got an interview. How this position works is he essentially would be working directly for two big investment banker types, but there was an office manager, we'll call her Sarah, who he also reported to as well. This office manager trained him, provided support, etc. During the interview, he was told that the base salary for the new position was $10,000 per year less, but there was monthly bonuses paid out that would bring him well over the salary cap for his previous position. Once he accepted, it didn't really sit well with me since he didn't get that in writing. He got along wonderfully with his investment banker bosses. They loved having someone so personable who also had connections in the branch. 
The divisions were kept pretty church and state, retail and wealth, so it saved a lot of time having Doug around since he could just message friends from retail to get information without having to go through all of the typical hoops. He also knew most of the systems already and got all of the courses he needed very quickly. Once lockdown got bad, offices were shut down. Everyone had to work from home. Since Doug was new, he got kind of done over. He was one of the last people to get a laptop. You can't use your own. Had one monitor. Regularly got stuck going into the office to mail things. Also, since he was new, he had a lot of questions and needed help regularly. With work from home, that meant Sarah had to put in a lot of effort to answer his questions. She was a miserable person. She was condescending, took a long time to answer him, or would just say, figure it out. It was incredibly frustrating for Doug, especially considering the bonus he was receiving was a fraction of what he was promised. He was making considerably less money and was doing a lot more work. After about a year, February 2021 at this point, Doug was doing very well at his position. The investment bankers regularly praised him and they even got him fancy Christmas gifts. The only downside was Sarah. She was still giving Doug a very hard time and just generally being rude and condescending. When Doug's one year rolled around, Sarah had a meeting with him about some issues a client was having. At the end of the meeting, she said, Since your contract renewal is coming up, you might want to consider keeping your options open and looking for some other positions in other departments. We both knew this was an empty threat since his actual bosses basically needed him at this point. One of them started having some pretty serious health issues and Doug was a superstar helping him through it while maintaining his book of business. We knew this was just Sarah trying to make him feel small. Even still, Doug was pretty upset after hearing this. He had been putting in 12 hour days for less money and was borderline being bullied by Sarah the entire time. So he decided to take her advice. He sent out one application to a different division of the bank, got a call back the same day. Turns out the lady who runs this division for our province used to work with Doug. She was his branch manager back when he was a teller. With this bank, in order to move to other departments, they touched base with your current boss. They spoke to both of his investment maker bosses and they were taken by total surprise. They called Doug to see why he was quitting since he was doing so well. They had no idea Sarah had promised him more money in the interview and that he took a pay cut to be there. They had no idea Sarah had been treating him the way she had been since they didn't interact with her often. A day or two later, he had a Zoom meeting with the investment banker bosses and Sarah. They tried to counter offer him the same salary, $17,000 more dollars per year, and Sarah changed her tune completely. Tried to backpedal on what she said about looking for other positions. Doug politely declined their offer and accepted the new position, partly because he felt taken advantage of since they were so easily able to give him almost a $20,000 pay raise, but also because he didn't feel secure in the position due to Sarah's remarks. His investment banker bosses still call him regularly, four months later, to help with clients. Some of their clients only want to speak with Doug or they need Doug's help with systems he designed to make their lives easier. Now Doug works from home still, makes $17,000 more dollars per year than he did in the wealth department and his investment banker bosses pay him a few hundred a week for his freelance work. Oh, and the best of it all is that Sarah took on all of Doug's duties for months while they found his replacement. Doug's investment banker bosses told him their new assistant is someone who worked in the mailroom at the office. He took three attempts to pass his exams and has no idea what he's doing. Have you ever had a coworker bully you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. You bully me all the time by making me listen to all these stories. It finally happened. Entitled parents demanded my print. Honestly, I've never ran into a Karen or an entitled person before, but I finally had my run in today with an entitled young couple. On with the story. So I had bought a nice print made by an artist located in Georgia, USA a couple months ago and have finally got it framed properly by Hobby Lobby. I like their services. And since this was my very first piece of artwork that wasn't some $10 poster, I wanted to go all out and make it look nice. However, a half hour ago, I went in to pick it up and it turned out beautifully. But there was another young couple sort of lurking around the pictures and framing area of the store and I could see them looking at me in my new print, which was being bagged by the very nice framing lady. Honestly, Hobby Lobby, 
Your employees are so sweet and helpful. As it was being bagged, they approached and looked at my print, commenting how nice it was and asking where I got it, etc. Being an introvert, but also enjoying conversation, I told them my little tale about how I got it and they thanked me. All is well, right? Wrong. A few minutes later, the framing lady got called elsewhere and left me in my framed print with a half-finished receipt. So I waited and hopped on my phone to answer some emails and texts from work. I work from home sometimes. But as I looked up, there was the entitled wife picking up my print with entitled husband standing behind her marveling at it. Me. Uh, hey, could y'all please put my print down? This was a lot of money to do and it's my first piece of artwork ever. Oh, hush. I'm just looking at it. I'm not hurting it now, am I? Me. Yeah, you are. You could potentially break the backing, which is just paper, and then I'd have to get it fixed, and I don't have all day to be here. Please put my property down. Entitled husband stands between us. Look, kid, we want this painting, and we just got married six months ago, and we could really use something nice to go in our bedroom to commemorate our six-month anniversary. Me. It's not for sale, sir. I don't want to have to go back to Georgia to buy a new one. Go find the artist yourself. I gave you his name. I don't care. You bought it before. You can buy it again. At this point, she was causing a scene and Entitled Husband was constantly blocking my way to save precious print. Then finally, the nice lady at Hobby Lobby came back. Nice lady. Excuse me, that's his. Entitled Husband. No, he stole it from us and is trying to claim it's his. We found this here in the store first and he just wants it for himself. Karen. Yeah. We found it a few aisles down. Me. They're lying. You know I came in here two weeks ago for this print, ma'am. The nice lady then looks at me and nods with a smirk. Nice lady. So, you two claim that you found this in my store, correct? The couple almost in unison. Yup. Nice lady. Well then, you would know that we don't sell anything with an artist's signature. But if you really do claim it's yours, then what's the artist's name? Neither of them could give an answer. Then I chime in to give the right one. Sorry, I'm not going to advertise the artist's name here out of respect for him. Then the nice lady simply told both of them to leave the store immediately or else she would have them trespassed. And since it was in a strip mall area, that means they would have been trespassed from the entire mall area. Sadly, they didn't escalate it like most stories, but it was nice to see some very entitled people get their just desserts. Performance review metrics in retail fail to consider that an entry-level employee might possess basic math skills. I used to work at a department store where the majority of sales volume came from clothing, and the primary target customer was women in their 30s and 40s. The raises there were based on a performance review, and at my first one I got a 3% raise. So for the next year I busted my butt in hopes of getting the maximum possible raise of 5% at my next review. Well, when the time came, Despite having a very good review, I probably had the highest scores out of the five or so people in my department, the customer service desk, I still only received a 3% raise. I was devastated. After leaving the office, I headed up to the break room and looked over the metrics in more detail. That's when I noticed that a full 30% of my review score came from the store's averaging score on the customer satisfaction surveys that print out with every receipt. Now, this particular company does not offer any incentive whatsoever to its customers, like five random respondents each month will win a $50 gift card to take the surveys, and you had to fill them out within a fairly short time period after your trip. I think it was 24 to 48 hours. So even though we had hundreds of customers come through the store every single day, we only received around 20 to 25 survey responses per week, so three or four per day. And of course, without any incentive to complete them, a customer who had had a bad experience would be far more likely to submit a survey than usual. In fact, I remember once or twice having a manager who had just denied a grumpy Karen's demands discreetly tell me, don't give her the survey slip. So, although we delivered a 5 out of 5 experience with 99% of all of our customers, the store's customer service score frequently fell in the range of 60 to 80%, varying wildly from one week to the next. Sure, there were times when our rolling weekly average would hit 100% for a few days, but I could never bring myself to reach the level of excitement over these occurrences that the managers tried to drum up in our morning huddles. 
knowing that it really just boiled down to us being lucky that whoever hadn't been 100% satisfied during that time period had just not bothered to fill out the survey. In statistics terms, the sample size of this survey was far too small to produce anything resembling an accurate representation of our true customer service performance. While I've never taken a statistics class, I have a passing interest in the subject, and based on the limited knowledge I've acquired throughout my life, I'd speculate that the margin of error for this survey score was probably on the order of 10 to 20 percentage points. This meant that nearly a third of my total review score was based on what was, essentially, a random number. So I continued to look over the various factors of the performance review score and their associated weights, and I reached a few enlightening conclusions. First, even if I got a perfect score on everything that could directly control all of the factors related to individual performance, the only way I could reach that 5% tier was for the store survey scores for the year to average 90% or more. An annual average of anything under 75% would earn just 2 out of 5 points on the review. Our store's annual average was usually in the low 80s. Secondly, as hard as I had worked on performing all of my individual performance metrics over the past year, I had gotten 4 out of 5 points on most of them, with only a couple 5 out of 5s. This still left me several points short of the threshold for even the 4% raise. So I did some calculations and determined that if, over the next year, I discontinued all attempts to impress my managers, put forth only as much effort as the employees that were college students, and just showed up on time for all of my shifts, I'd end up with all 2s and 3s on my next review. But the store's survey score would actually help my score enough to still qualify me for a 3% raise. So that's exactly what I did. I stopped trying to do things as quickly as possible and instead worked at a pace that would avoid breaking a sweat. And mind you, for some reason the store was always around 76 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So this meant I actually moved even more slowly than is my natural inclination, which tends to be a bit faster than your average person. When working a cashier shift, I stopped proactively scanning the spare copies of the coupons that were kept at each cash register for the various 15% off everything coupons that were constantly sent out in the mail for every customer who came through my line. We were allowed, mildly encouraged, but certainly not required to do this. Instead, only scanning it for folks who explicitly asked if I had it. If I wasn't working at a register where it would be blatantly obvious, I'd spend 20 to 25 minutes on my 15 minute breaks. When working a shift on the sales floor, instead of working diligently and methodically to straighten up every shelf and table, I'd just spend enough time on the worst ones to get them looking reasonably decent, then spend an hour or two just walking laps around the store, looking like I was on my way somewhere, stopping only when a customer flagged me down. Whenever I was working directly with a customer, I'd still provide great customer service, but for everyone else, I was just phoning it in. Sure enough, a year later, the comments on my review were a lot more critical than they had ever been, and yet, I once again had a 3% raise. That raise was oh so much more rewarding than any of the previous ones had been. This became my status quo for the rest of the time I worked there, until I landed a full-time tech support job and said sayonara to retail once and for all. I distinctly remember when I turned in my notice, the store manager said, Well, we'll miss you. If you ever want to come back for some extra cash around the holidays or anything, we'll bring you back on at the same rate you have now. I was making $8.43 while the state minimum was $7.25. My new job was paying me $11 an hour. I said, yeah, that's not going to happen. I don't care who you get to come in, lady. It isn't me. I'm a travel nurse that works in surgery. In my field, we frequently have to be on call where we have to sit around at home after our normal hours. If we are called, in this instant, by the hospital operator, we come in for whatever surgery they need us to work. This one place I worked gave me all sorts of problems, from trying to do me out of pay to giving me the worst assignments, the flat out assigning me to be on call more often than others. When it was finally about time for me to leave, I was over everything about that department. I did notice, however, that they had me on the schedule as being on call several times, up to two to three weeks after my contract had ended. I ignored it and gleefully went on to my next assignment. About two weeks later, my phone rang with a Kentucky phone number. It was 5 a.m. on a Saturday, so I ignored it. They called two more times before I picked up, and the conversation went like this. Me. Hello? Operator. Is this McNew? Why didn't you answer the first few calls? 
You are on call. You are required to answer. Me. First, yes, I am McNew. Second, I didn't feel like answering those calls at 5 a.m. Third, I can assure you I am not on call. Operator. Yes, you are. You need to come in. One of the doctors wants to do insert non-emergent elective surgery here at 7 a.m. Me. Lady, there's no way I'm going to make it there by 7 a.m. She interrupts me. Why not? You are responsible for responding to being called in within 30 minutes, which I will be tracking from my first call that you ignored. Me. Listen, I'm currently an 11-hour drive away. I do not work at your hospital anymore. I suggest you get a hold of the surgery department's manager. Operator. Oh, um, okay. I'll try that. I lay back down and 15 minutes later I get another call. I answer and I immediately recognize the shrill voice. Department manager. Why aren't you going into work? You are expected to be responsible when on call. Me. Well, if I factor in the time zone difference, it will be about 5 p.m. before I arrive. How do you not realize the person you are yelling at hasn't worked for you for weeks? DM then hits me with the absolute silliest question. Well, who am I supposed to get to cover this call and come into work? Me. I truly do not care. I suppose the manager could go in and take care of it though. Click. I hung up the phone and thankfully did not receive any more calls. Am I the jerk for leaving a meal at my partner's friend's house and stranding him there? My partner's friends and I have never got on very well. Our personalities just don't gel, and apart from my partner, we have nothing in common. One of them decided to throw a dinner party. They asked about allergies, and I actually have a pretty unusual one. I come out in rashes if I eat lychee, which really upsets me because I love lychee. Anyway, I told them about this allergy, even though hardly anyone uses lychee in recipes. Can you see where this is going? The evening arrives. I don't drink anyway, so I drive us both to their house. The dinner party begins. It's going quite nicely. Conversation is pleasant. Then they serve the starter. It has lychee in it. Thinking about how much effort they had to go to to obtain and think of a savory dish, I was pretty angry but held it in. Then the main had lychee too. This is the point where I walked out. In fact, I walked home. It was only about 5 miles and the walk helped clear my head. I ignored the phone calls from my partner, although I did message to say I was safely home. I had forgotten I was my partner's lift home. He got a taxi back a couple of hours later and we had an argument where he thought I was wrong for leaving him unable to get home. He had had a bottle of wine by the time I left and I was upset that he hadn't told his friends that what they had done was not how you treat people that you've invited to your house. I was also upset that he had stayed there anyway. If my friends had treated him like that, I'd have left their house along with him. Who was right and wrong? Both? Neither? Edit. This blew up overnight. Sorry I can't reply to everyone individually. Events of the next day. First, he woke up extra early, walked over there and retrieved my car so I wouldn't have to. Turns out, he phoned the taxi about 10 minutes after I had left. He showed me the log, so most of the time he spent there was waiting for the taxi. He did confront them and asked them what they were playing at. Turns out it was some sort of revenge for a barbecue a month earlier that had included vegetarian and halloumi skewers that we brought. One of his friends is lactose intolerant. He said that he's actually the one who prepared those. He didn't know his friend was lactose intolerant and even if it had been me being deliberate, this isn't the way adults respond. If they had a problem with it, they should have said so at the point, not cooked up a nasty revenge. They messaged him after he left and his reply is he'll accept their apology if and when I do. For some people asking, they did know it's a rash level allergy, not a death level allergy. They wanted to make me uncomfortable, which is still horrible. So yeah, turns out he does stand up to them when really pushed. Edit 2. I don't think they actually intended me to eat it. I feel like if it was the goal, they'd have disguised it within the dishes. There were whole lychee on top of the dish. I think it was meant to be obvious to me that they were in there with the intention of feeling left out rather than harmed. Speaking of allergies, do you have anything you're allergic to? And if so, what is it? Please let us know. I'm allergic to thumbs downs, so please give the video a thumbs up instead. Thank you. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.